It is June 23rd, 2020, and um, I would like to welcome you to the Lexington One Board of Trustees board meeting. Um, it is now 6.03, and uh, do I hear a motion to enter into executive, executive session to consider employment recommendations for 2021 and a legal briefing regarding potential litigation? Madam Chair, I move that the board enter into executive session to consider employment recommendations for 2020-2021 and a legal briefing regarding potential litigation. And thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments, board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of going into executive session, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous and we are now in executive sessions. Um, I wanna welcome everyone. It's June 23rd, 2020, and I wanna welcome you to the third reading which is also the final public hearing for the 2020-2021 general fund operating budget. We're going to do it live and virtually, so bear with us. We've got a lot of technology going on, so we hope it's all gonna work. Um, at this time, do I hear a motion to conclude executive session and begin the 2020-2021 general fund budget hearing? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments, board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of beginning the, uh, the public hearing, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries and it is unanimous. Um, we are officially calling this hearing to order and I would like to remind you that we are in compliance with the governor's orders and CDC recommendations. The auditorium has been thoroughly cleaned and sanitized before the meeting and will be after the meeting also. District staff will also sanitize the microphone before and after staff presentations or individuals speaking during citizens participation. All board members, employees, and other individuals in attendance are encouraged to social distance and to wear a mask at all times. There is limited seating tonight. Once all the seats in here are full, and I think we still have three if anyone else wants to join us, attendees are asked to go to the staff development uh, room, which is also called the overflow room, where we, we will have a live feed where they can watch the meeting while observing social distancing guidelines. The public is encouraged to watch the meeting on our YouTube channel. After the meeting, the district will follow its previously established process by posting a video of the meeting to the district's YouTube channel, Lexington One video site, and our own website. I would like to remind you that the district is in compliance with the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act. We have notified the media of the date time and place of this hearing. The district tapes this hearing for accuracy and preparing the minutes. At this time, I would like to call on Dr. Powers to lead us in, their, in our invocation and our Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Powers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty these days, which leads to a lot of unrest. Uh, and so I searched for a prayer of peace. So I found this, uh, a lot of you have heard it, it's the St. Francis of uh, uh, UCC. I always say that wrong. Um, it's prayer, and I've modified it a little bit for Lexington One. So let's bow our heads. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow charity. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is dying to our self-interest that we can serve this community of learners. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Um, at this time, we're going to go to uh, agenda item 5.0, which is the third and final reading for our 2020-2021 proposed general fund budget. And uh, Mr. Salters, who's our chief financial officer, will present that uh, budget reading. He's going to do it virtually. Um, he's in on a conference call. 
So, Mr. Salters, I'm going to turn it over to you, but I would like to uh, remind everyone that we do have members from finance with us tonight. And so, we, would you all raise your hands if you, and all the finance people are here. So, uh, we've got back up in the room. So, okay, Mr. Salters, you ready? Okay, can you hear me okay now? Is that okay? It's not. If it echoes, let us know. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Salter. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. All right, well, uh, thank you for uh, in indulging me um, this evening in um, truly social distance uh, presentation of the third reading. I do apologize for not being able to be there in person. Um, However, I am um, actually under under quarantine uh, with my family right now, um, and so we'll just leave it at that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, get started with the presentation. Um, as, as mentioned, this is the third uh, reading of the budget, and we would be speaking um, action this evening um, later on in the, in the meeting um, on this budget. Um, just to start with a, a, a quick reminder, the general fund um, budget is used for operating expenditures. Um, it's, it's basically the roadmap for the district's revenues um, and how those revenues are going to be expended to uh, conduct the day-to-day -day operations of the school district. Uh, conversely, we have uh, capital funds um, that um, you may hear about from time to time, and those funds um, are funds that are restricted by law and bond covenant and um, are designated really for major building programs, uh, technology, uh, renovations, um, other items such as uh, buses, library books, band instruments, and things like that um, are also used for capital funding. Um, but they are not typically used for the day-to-day um, operations uh, of the school district um, and I wanted to take just a, a, a minute to um, talk to you about our capital funding um, we just this past week um, were able to, to uh, conduct the refunding that you voted on a few months ago the bond market came back um, to, to say a little bit and it became favorable again for us to um, move forward with that refunding. And we uh, were able to um, go through our ratings with Moody's and Standard & Poor's, um, the two rating agencies. And you see on the screen there um, our ratings were affirmed, um, again, um, by both rating agencies. Um, and I just highlighted a couple of quotes uh, from Moody's. Um, exactly the mitigation strategies they're looking for uh, during this time to maintain a strong financial performance. Um, and then S&P uh, demonstrated strong financial performance resulting in a long track record of strength and stability. Uh, couldn't ask for anything more um, out, of a, out of a government entity. So those are uh, obviously the two most popular um, rating agencies in, in the United States. And for those to, to recognize the, the performance that the district has maintained over many years um, is, a, is a testament to the board and the, and the stability um, of our finances. So I just wanted to highlight that as part of uh, what we're doing. And I would add as part of the refunding um, that we were able to, uh, go, going through that, we're actually originally estimated to save um, roughly 7 to $8 million dollars. Um, and actually, uh, we actually ended up saving $12.6 million, and that present value of the savings is $12.6 million. So um, that's a significant uh, amount of funding uh, or savings, I should say, to our taxpayers over the course of those bonds that were, that were refunded. So, um, you know, you couple that with uh, the recent bond sale that we did where we, we got a uh, roughly $15 million premium um, payment to us, you know, that's uh, 27 um, million and some change just in this year um, that, that the district has seen in, in savings and also premium um, as a result of stable uh, budget and stable uh, financial position. So um, that's just kind of a good shout out for, for you, you, the board, for um, overseeing that. So 
moving on to our, our budget, um, some considerations that we um, were looking at in this budget process. Obviously, this is a very uh, different time frame than we, we've dealt with in years past. Um, we do anticipate some, some funding shortfalls um, in this fiscal year. Uh, the General Assembly uh, passed a continuing resolution um, to fund us at the same level uh, next year as we are this year, at least, you know, to, to start the year. Um, but we don't know what other shortfalls may, may come about. Um, they're scheduled to get back together on the 15th of September to look at the general appropriations bill uh, going forward. So uh, we're obviously continuing to monitor the economy um, and any other further actions that the General Assembly is um, looking at. Um, along with that, uh, the Board of Economic Advisors were, were following their work and predictions. Um, and we will likely um, – have to do a budget amendment at some point um, after uh, a general appropriations bill is passed this fall uh, with the General Assembly. Um, and <clears throat> some additional considerations, you know, our proposed budget uh, really focuses on quality education and support uh, for our students and staff. That's uh, what the district has uh, come to be known for. Uh, currently, there is no uh, salary step increase included um, at this time. Um, that's related to a couple factors. One is the uncertainty of the state funding, but the other is uh, um, uh, the, the continuing resolution. I'll speak more on that in a minute. Uh, the proposed budget is designed to provide for student growth um, and, and meet state and federal requirements. And then we do have some inflationary costs that we have to meet uh, within this budget. Obviously, some priorities for us this, this year. Um, are to open Centerville Elementary School. Uh, and part of that opening is to restructure Gilbert Elementary and Gilbert Primary Schools. We'll also be relocating Pillion Middle School um, and excited about opening the College Center um, at Gilbert High School. And then, um, you know, we're preparing for the impact of, of, of COVID-19 and the many unknowns uh, associated uh, with that. Um, just taking a look at our average daily membership uh, and, and our growth, historical growth, um, you can see right now we're projecting um, 527 students in growth. Um, this will be an interesting number to watch this year. Um, and I know that later this evening we're going to be talking about some different options for what start of school may look like. Uh, but we right now are looking at at some additional growth uh, coming into our community. Um, so we, we will be watching that very closely. Um, the, you know, the 27034 number there um, is a, a projection, and it, it does not include um, our, our three- and four-year-olds. And at, last year we had 847 of those students. So uh, we're, we're approaching 28,000. Should the growth um, occur as we, we would expect? Um, <clears throat> speaking back to salaries uh, briefly, um, as I mentioned, currently there's no step or, or uh, salary increase for any employees in the uh, proposed budget. Um, obviously, the district feels uh, employees deserve a raise, um, and and so um, or a step increase, a you know year of experience step increase. Um, at this time, the district is legally restricted from providing that step increase for teachers, um, and that's in uh, Part 2, Section 4D of the um, Act 1 and 35, which is uh, that continuing resolution. Um, and so we don't feel it's prudent to move forward with other raises for other employees until we see what the General Assembly uh, is going to do for teachers uh, in the fall. Um, you know, couple that with the, the uncertainty of, of the economic impact of COVID-19. Um, you know, we, we feel like we, you know, we need to kind of see where things are going and then what the General Assembly does. Um, when the state uh, passes, you know, uh, General Appropriations Act um, in the fall, we certainly will move quickly to amend the district's budget uh, to incorporate uh, any raises that, um, 
might be associated with that act. And, you know, we do anticipate that um, those raises would be, you know, for the contract year for, for employees. So it would um, be retroactive should it occur later in the fall um, than when teachers come back and start. Um, <clears throat> taking a look at our, our general fund staffing and, um, you know, this is kind of an overall net um, out of our staffing changes. Um, you know, I mentioned we're looking at 527 um, new students potentially, but we um, are only looking at an overall net change of uh, 15 and a half staff members. This, this has not changed um, since uh, first reading. Um, and you, you'll notice that at the elementary level, we have um, actually reduced uh, six FTE. That's being accomplished by uh, increasing ratios by one um, at, at kindergarten, first and second grade um, to 23 to one. Um, and so, you know, of course, those those staffing ratios and numbers will have different meanings um, as we go to open school and and talk further about that later this evening. But, um, you know, that's how we're budgeting at this point. Um, and if you come on down, you'll see, um, you know, positions for our special needs um, uh, students and um, the, the nine um, staff members there for um, support staff for special needs our instructional assistants, and those are transfers. Actually, they're not new positions. They're in the general, excuse me, they're in the district now, but they're, they were funded by IDEA, and that funding uh, is continuing to uh, decrease. And so those nine positions are having to be transferred to the general fund. Um, and so we're picking those up. That uh, IDEA, uh, one of the questions came back. Um, recently from one of the board members regarding that funding. We're supposed to be funded at 40% uh, by the federal government, and we're actually funded only at about 14% uh, percent for IDEA. Um, and so, again, 15 and a half FTE there. Um, Ms. Garris asked for, uh, at our second reading, a breakdown of our uh, Gilbert um, and Centerville um, FTE, and so this is a, a, a display of that that shows, um, you know, the, the current fiscal year at the top and how those FTE are, are broken out, and then um, the upcoming fiscal year where um, we'll have Gilbert Elementary School and then Centerville Elementary School, um, and the, the breakdown of uh, the, the FTE to open um, uh, or reconfigure those two facilities and uh, looking at our increases in programs and services um, you know I mentioned some um, impacts of COVID-19 um, the unemployment compensation is, is one of those impacts uh, we um, anticipate our unemployed we are a, um, a reimbursable employer to the South Carolina um, unemployment system and so we will be invoiced uh, for uh, basically un, um, unemployment claims and we have seen a, a increase in those uh, during this time and we, we've projected that out uh, through the end of the year and anticipate um, this liability um, growing to this point. Uh, we do, um, I, will, I will tell you this amount of money is being included in our CARES Act funding request. And so it's very possible that um, that will be uh, reimbursed through CARES Act funding um, um, if that plan is approved. Um, we've got some uh, increases for safety and, and security. We were funded um, for uh, some additional SROs. Uh, through the State Department of Education uh, this, this year, and we have to provide um, equipment, uh, the, the fringe cost of their, of their benefits, um, uh, not the salary. They only cover salary. Um, and then we also have factored in a, a 3% um, salary increase 
um, for the county, which um, they are in in their budget conversations as well. In fact, they may I believe they may have their last reading this evening on their budget, but we have to plan for increased costs associated with those SROs. Um, employee assistance program is a very important uh, program that our uh, human resource uh, division um, has uh, sought bids for and uh, identified a, a vendor to move forward with. This will really help um, on that social, emotional, um, and cultural well-being of our staff. In, um, um, you'll find that large districts like ours um, all offer this. It's a very uh, good benefit for our our employees and and really reduces um, you know turnover workplace uh, incidents of absenteeism things like that because it it um, really gives them uh, you know an out and someone to to talk to so we're really interested in, in moving forward with that that additionally qualifies for CARES Act funding and so we um, have incorporated that into our CARES Act uh, plan uh, for potential reimbursement as well. <clears throat> workers' compensation premiums, um, this is one of those inflationary costs. It's based on your, your risk, and so that, that number um, is given directly as a premium increase. Um, some decreases in programs and services. I'll tell you that um, we've worked really hard. I really appreciate our senior leadership team, our principals, um, and departments, uh, directors in our departments, really working hard to, to identify uh, some cuts this year. Um, I mentioned in second, first and second reading, we've taken a really hard look account by account using budget actual numbers um, and going through and identifying areas where we may have had some, some funding um, that was unspent last year. We've, we've uh, recouped that and reduced that. Um, we've reduced um, our supplies and, and um maintenance and, and repairs um, line items. Of course, we have a, a referendum out right now um, that provides for some additions, renovations, and so forth at, at our school facility. So we're uh, working uh, with that funding to offset some of this. Um, cutting travel. Um, we don't anticipate folks traveling a whole lot this fall um, and on into the, into the year. Uh, the Staff Services International Exchange Digital Program, this is our program that our Human Resource Division uses to onboard our um, international teachers. Um, and we're not cutting the program. Um, there was just uh, an amount of money budgeted there that was not um, – we weren't using that much money, and so um, we, we cut that back to align it with the expenditures. Um and, and so that brings your, your total decreases uh, to that $1.609 million. Now, this, in this um, slide is, is where you'll recognize your, your really your only change from third reading, um, and it is an increase to a decrease, um, which I know sounds a little confusing, but that's a good thing. Uh, we, we were able to renegotiate a contract in our IT um, division and so the technology supplies and services line item actually increased by ninety thousand um, dollars which is an overall decrease to the budget so um, we're, we're pleased about that um, moving on to our uh, school fees we've had some conversations about this in our um, previous two readings and we, we have uh, continued to recommend uh, these fee reductions um, and so we, uh, um, again, looking at our $6 kindergarten consumable fee being eliminated, uh, the $28 grade one through uh, five fee reduced to um, $20. And then at the high school level, uh, the $5 consumable fee being eliminated, um, the $5 language arts parallel reading fee eliminated, um, and then the $25 parking fee being reduced to um, $5. Um, and as you recall, in, um, this is, uh, as I mentioned in previous readings, this is a kind of a systematic approach that we've taken over the uh, past uh, few years under Dr. Little's leadership. Uh, we started with the elementary supply list, um, trying to reduce uh, the overall impact um, of, of our attending our schools uh, to our families. And, and then we moved to the middle school um, 
some middle school word fee reductions this past year. And um, now we've targeted some elementary and high school fees um, this year. We, we continue to look at those um, and will continue to look at those. Um, it's, it's our goal to make sure that, you know, fees collected are used, um, you know, for the stated purpose and for the amount that, that's needed. Um, and then our schools are maintaining a, a you know, good um, control over that um, aspect of, um, of their budgets. The uh, school paid meal prices, I mentioned this in second reading. We, we um, were handed this information from uh, the USDA. Um, and so um, that's representing a, a, a 10 cent increase um, on each of those meals. Um, the uh, reduced meal uh, price still stays the same. It is, it is not impacted by the 10 cent. So that reduced meal price is uh, 30 cent for breakfast and 40 cent for lunch. Um, but that, that information is given to us by, uh, by the USDA. Um, so just moving on to our projected revenue, um, the only change that you see here from second to third reading, uh, we have uh, reduced um, the operational balance by $90,000. Um, we, um, by renegotiating that contract, we will not um, need that $90,000 in revenue obviously now. And so we would reduce the use of operational balance by that $90,000. But overall, I would, I would, you know, just call your attention to, um, you know, the, the projected decrease in the budget um, and by $8 million. Um, you know, we talked in the previous reading about uh, some different strategies we're using uh, for budgeting. Uh, one of those strategies being um, our salary um, uh, and our, our fill rate on our salaries. Um, we had in the past been budgeting at 100% uh, fill rate, and reality is we the highest fill rate we've seen in the last um, really five to seven years is about a 98% fill rate. Um, and so uh, we are looking at uh, but this year's budget, including a 98% fill rate as our as our base, and so um, that generates some some savings on on salary um, and, that, and that's a, a big chunk of that um, uh, on the expenditure side so just want to point some of that out we have talked with the county um, in fact I heard a statement uh, this evening uh, regarding the county's budget that they do not anticipate any major um, revenue shortfalls um, in, in their local um, tax revenue so that's good news for us um, and, and we'll, but we'll continue to monitor that. Um, our, our revenues are aligned with the actual um, uh, received revenues this year that we that we have. Um, and so again, you see the eight million dollar uh, reduction there. And the expenditure side, uh, as I mentioned, we've gone through and really targeted um, all the accounts uh, going through and. And look at each each department, and um, our, our our schools have done really good work looking at their budgets, um, and and so we are right now proposing a, a approximately eight million dollar decrease in the budget. Uh, certainly, General Appropriations Act comes out and, and gives teachers a step. Um, you know that 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 money would would change that um, overall expenditure column um, a good bit, but um, we would hope that some of the associated revenue would come in to, to help support that. Um, so looking again at, um, this is kind of a, a graphic that just shows, um, you know, that we are um, a people business, a service business, our, our best resource um, and, and most, uh, our greatest asset is our teaching staff. And that's where the bulk of our, our funding goes, uh, salaries and related costs. And then you see the um, smaller percentages there for programs and services and then our utilities and, and maintenance uh, cost. Speak briefly about Act 388, um, the allowable millage increase. We talked about this already uh, in our previous readings. Um, we could generate um, potentially $3.6 million uh, roughly in um, uh, 
mill, and additional revenue by levying um, our allowable millage. Um, and so, but you notice that um, we are recommending in this budget, uh, we continue to recommend zero mills on the operational side for an increase. Um, and that's primarily because we feel strongly that our, um, you know, our families and our communities and our businesses have all been impacted um, by the uh, COVID-19 virus. And so it's not, it's not only important to focus on mental um, health and wealth, but it's important to focus on economic health and wealth. And so we feel like preserving that zero millage increase will help our local businesses um, in the best way we can, we can reach out to them. So just in summary, um, you know, the revenue projections, as I said earlier, will remain at the same level right now. Um, as they are this year, um, our local revenue projections have declined, um, and, and some due to the economic uh, climate. But but more, uh, it's it's actually more about the actual collections that we've taken in. Um, the 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 budgeted revenue this past year um, was just higher than what we've actually taken in this year, and so we've adjusted those, those budget figures to more closely align with that revenue in, um, income stream. Um, we are including funding to meet our federal and state mandates um, and uh, our inflationary costs. Um, we do have funding included to restructure and, and relocate the identified schools in the building program. Um, and as I said, no millage increase on our own operational um, budget. And uh, just, you know, again, reiterate that a budget amendment will be likely um, this fall due to, a, you know, passes of an, a general appropriations bill by the General Assembly. So, um, Madam Chair, with that, um, you know, that is our, our third reading um, proposal, and I'd be happy to um, answer any questions that you have at this time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Salters. We appreciate that third reading and we appreciate you adjusting as we moved along in this process and we look forward to hearing what the legislature uh, determines in the fall when they reconvene. Board, you've now heard the third reading. Uh, tonight is the night we will vote on this budget. We will be voting during our general session which follows this public hearing. But at this time, do you have any questions or comments you'd like to uh, ask Mr. Salters or the finance team? Um, Mr. Salters, this is um, Amory Green. Thank you for the, um, the presentation. And I know that um, this budget uh, reflects a lot of belt tightening. Um, and I um, appreciate all that you and your staff have done to uh, kind of prepare us for the current situation. Um, and I'm not trying to ask you to like predict the future, um, but have you already anticipating that possibly the Appropriations Act that um, the General Assembly passes in September could um, impact us uh, negatively. Have y has your um, team started projecting where additional belt tightening can uh, take place? Should well, that's, that, should that's a great that be point. necessary? Um, well, that's a great point, um, and and you're correct. You know, the General Assembly should they fund. Um, you know, a, a step for teachers, as an example, or or some form of that, they, they uh, will likely not uh, provide all of the funding associated with that because our uh, they usually fund at the state minimum salary schedule, and our district funds um, a percentage above that, and so we will have a local match to have to uh, come up with to to uh, provide that uh, step increase. And so, um, you know, we certainly are, are looking at ways to, uh, to, you know, meet that match um, and, and, and different options that um, we've got. Um, obviously, uh, one of the, the ways to, to accomplish that in, in a given year is to, uh, you know, use some of your operational balance to make up that gap uh, for a year and then um, revisit it um, you know, in your budget process um, as you go through the next year. Um, there are other ways, you know, to cut additional, um, you know, services or programs that are out there. Um, 
And so we'll be looking at those adjustments as we go. I'll tell you that we, um, you know, really every day we're, we're monitoring the changes that um, are, are coming about with the, the way that we may open school and what that looks like and associated uh, costs and staffing needs. And, and so um, really uh, we're monitoring it every, uh, literally every day because there's something changing every day. So uh, we will continue to prepare for that. Um, and have conversations with you, you guys, as we as we get move forward, um, so that you know you have plenty of uh, understanding and, and um, notice of your different options. Um, should we have to meet some, you know, matching uh, of that? Well, and, and I mean, I think a very um, good example of um, a good thing with an unintended consequence is the funding for the additional um, SROs and safety personnel and the cost that we incur. Um, for you know, the General Assembly is really good at um, the headlines. There's more money for SRO and security, but the district has to pick up the equipment and the, the vehicles and the fringe benefits. Um, and so the actual cost for some things is usually not funded in full. That, is that mm -hmm. accurate? That is, that is very accurate. Yeah. Yes. And even our existing SROs, this is Cindy, even the existing SROs, uh, what percent does the Sheriff's Department and the town uh, police departments, what percent do they pay of their current salaries, the ones we already have on our books? Um, yeah, it's like, it's like 75, 25. Um, and, so you then know, we, case, we pay 20, 75 like that, and they so. pay 25, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's correct. That's correct. And then we, we, we typically provide the equipment um, and uh, the equipment, including the car and the, uh, um, you know, officer equipment that they wear and, and use. We appreciate them. It's just that I, I, I want people to understand that they're, they're not employees that are just given to us with no, no strings. They all come with strings that in order to maintain that position. Uh, board members, any other questions or comments for the for Mr. Salters before we open it up for public comment? Uh, yeah, Mr. Mm -hmm. Salters, I have a question. Um, they were just talking about SROs and we provide their vehicle equipment. Was that a decision made here locally? Because I don't believe that all districts provide these same things for their SROs. Um, the, uh, the contracts for those SROs are negotiated with the uh, different agencies that provide them. Um, and so that's a local um, it, it's a local county, if you will, um, negotiation, um, you know, with, with our sheriff's department, um, you know, and the county council oversees that. And then with our uh, town municipalities, uh, the town of Pelion and the town of Lexington, um, those different municipalities. Um, and, and, and we actually have slightly different arrangements with each one, um, but those are negotiated locally. Okay, thank you. Um, your page 12, which is mm, my old page nine, um, you mentioned you have incorporated some of these into our CARES Act plan for the potential reimbursement. How much have you asked for for reimbursement through the CARES Act? So our CARES Act funding um, it, that we potentially uh, can receive is roughly th about $3 million. Um, and so uh, the two um, items that I showed on the screen here are, are two, of, two of the uh, potential reimbursements that uh, we're looking at incorporating into that plan. And there's about 12 different categories of ex expenditures that um, either future expenditures or, or you know, past expenditures going back to March that um, could qualify. Thank you. You also said the district is legally restricted from providing step increases for teachers at this time. Do you have that specific language out of those that you quoted? Yeah, it's, um, let me get to that page here. Hang on one second. Um, it, the state minimum is um, part two, section 4D states the state minimum teacher minimum salary schedule will remain at the fiscal year 1920 funding level Step increases are suspended until the annual General Appropriations Act for fiscal year 2020-21 is enacted. 
Okay. I interpret that to mean that the state is suspending those, oh. but the state schedule is a minimum and state funding is only part of the teacher salaries. Um, I don't interpret that to mean that we are restricted from providing step increases. I mean, does anyone else interpret that a different way? I, I'm, I'm just going off of the information. We oh, have yeah, I was asking the, the board. Department. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'm just wondering. I was looking at the board. You're not here, so <laughs> you okay. couldn't see. Sorry. Mr. Salters, I guess kind of in line with that question, if there is a legal restriction there and, you know, let's, let's paint the brightest possible future and say things actually look pretty good from a financial perspective, do we have any sort of um, uh, history of, of a bonus type situation uh, with staff or um, uh, uh, teachers that if we, even if we couldn't provide a step increase but found ourselves financially um, in, in a good place at the end of the year that we have done that in the past? Dr. Guyton, um, you know, I've been here going on 25 years and I have not, in, in my 25 years, we have not uh, given employees any kind of bonus um, or additional stipend that, that was not related to, um, you know, a, a board policy leave buyout of some kind or leave payment. Um, the... Um, that that has not been not been done thank you and, and my only comment is um i want to thank y'all in fiscal affairs for working through this I, I don't no one can predict the future but i think the acceleration of um of technology and our ability to facilitate our daily needs as well as our work uh, through technology is not going to go away even with hopefully COVID uh, abates, which means more people are going to be working out of their homes, which means more com less commercial business sites. It means more people are going to be ordering from firms that are not local, that are national. So I'm really concerned that our tax base here in this county is going to shrink. And then I'm nervous, uh, and I think the state's doing a little bit better about collecting sales tax on all the internet revenue, but I'm nervous that sales tax revenue, which again, those are two huge funding sources. So I'm nervous moving forward, you know, three, five, seven, ten years from now about a sustainable funding model. So I think this is a first year of many that we're going to have to be very diligent about any potential increases because I don't think that tax base is coming back. So, but I may be wrong and I hope I'm wrong. Board, any other questions or comments for Mr. Salters? Okay, hearing none at this point. Thank you, Mr. Salters. We're going to go to citizens' uh, public comment on the budget. Um, and let me remind uh, the people who are here, this particular portion of public comment is only regarding the public hearing for the budget. If you want to comment on anything else, that will be during our general session, which will follow this session. So this is only for the budget. I do have a card. So I am going to read the guidelines. So the Lexington County School District 1 Board of Trustees provides a time for citizens' participation during the public hearing on the general fund budget. There are a few guidelines, of course. First, in order to speak, you must be a parent or legal guardian of a student in Lexington County School District 1 or a resident and a taxpayer of the district. Second, each speaker will have three minutes. Third, you may comment on the 2020-2021 proposed general fund budget. However, you may not speak about specific individuals, whether students or staff. There are other ways to bring situations like that to the board's attention. We want to give everyone who came here tonight a chance to speak, so uh, board members will not reply to your individual remarks. And if someone makes the point or points you came to make before you, if you could just state that you agree with the previous speakers and not restate every point that would help us move along. We also ask that you not clap or make any comments either while an individual is speaking or after a speaker finishes as that also slows down the process considerably. If we wanted you to speak to, if you wanted to speak tonight, we ask you to fill out a card that gave us your name and address for our records. Those cards were in the sign in table as you came into the meeting. If you have not filled out a card and wish to speak to us about the budget, only the budget, <laughs> just want to remind you, Hold up your hand and Ms. Hill will provide a card for you at this time. Do I have anyone else who wants to speak that has not provided a card? 
Okay, we'll go to the card then. Um, I'd like to invite Ms. Ch Chelsea Snellgrove to the, um, back to the monitor in the back. She lives at 344 Kaiser Road, Lexington, South Carolina, and uh, she has a student at Red Bank Elementary, and she's going to talk about the budget. Ms. Snellgrove. Thank you. Um, I know times are tough, but um, hear me out. Uh, uh, I have something to say about the budget. It might not concern the general budget specifically, um, but um, here goes. I believe we can all agree that kids deserve equal education regardless of socioeconomic status or race. With that said, it is obvious to me that in Lexington School District 1, equal opportunities do not exist for all students. I've looked on in awe of the plans for the new Centerville Elementary School and found the comparison to my son's elementary school, the same one that I attended over 25 years ago, shockingly unequal. Students at the new Centerville will be given opportunities in several clubs that are not offered at my son's school and will have access to state-of-the-art technologies also not available at my son's school. Although disparities in student opportunities are seen across the board, these inequities are most evident in our elementary schools. Using data collated from the National Center for Educational Statistics and Lexington One's 2019 uh, CFAR, I've noticed an alarming trend in the pupil activity funds in general Schools with higher numbers of minorities and impoverished students disperse significantly less money towards uh, student activity expenditures. For example, Saxagatha Elementary has approximately 35% minority students and 56% students on free or reduced lunch programs. Their approximate spending per pupil on activity expenditures is $99. By contrast, Midway Elementary has approximately seven minority students 7% minority students and 8% students on free or reduced lunch. Meanwhile, their approximate spending per pupil on activity expenditures is $281, almost triple that of Saxagatha. White Knoll Middle, which has approximately 40% minority students and 53% students on free or reduced lunch, spends a paltry $235 per pupil on activity expenditures while Pleasant Hill Middle has about 19% minority students and 14% students on free and reduced lunch and spends roughly $525 per pupil on activity expenditures, more than double that of White Knoll Middle. These are just a few examples which highlight the inequities that marginalized students in our district face. With that said, I'm calling on the school board to address these issues and actively work to create equal opportunities for students and look for ways to create equity through the budget. Thank you, Ms. Snellgrove. We appreciate that. Anyone else wishing to address the board regarding the budget? Okay, at this time, we are going to adjourn the public hearing of the 2020-2021 proposed general fund um, operating budget. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Green. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? The motion carries and we are now adjourned. We will take, let's see, it's six minutes till eight. We'll take six minutes and we'll be reconvened back at eight o'clock. Thank you. But we're just getting started, so stay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I'm gonna be here.
I think we're about ready to get started, and let me get my technology guru back there, Mr. Josh. How are we looking, Josh? Are we ready to go? Okay, we got a thumbs up. That's always a good sign in today's age. So, again, it is June 23rd, 2020, and I want to welcome all of you to our main June meeting. We have a full agenda tonight. We've already had our budget hearing, which we will vote on shortly. And then now we're going to go into our regular, uh, to our regular general session. And uh, so do I hear a motion to call to order the June 23rd, 2020 board general session? Madam Chair, I move that the board begin the general session of the June 23rd, 2020 board meeting. Okay, thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Are there any questions or comments, board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. We are meeting tonight in compliance with the governor's orders and CDC recommendations. The auditorium has been thoroughly cleaned and sanitized before this meeting, and it will be after the meeting as well. District staff will also sanitize the microphone before and after staff presentations or individuals speaking during citizens' participation. All board members, employees, or other individuals in, atten in attendance are encouraged to social distance and to wear a mask at all times. And you guys are doing good. Everybody's got on a mask. Thank you for doing that. There is limited seating. Once this room is filled, attendees are asked to go to the staff development room or overflow room, which is at the end of the hall, where we are having a live feed, and you can watch the meeting and observe social distancing guidelines. The public is encouraged to watch the meeting on our YouTube channel. After the meeting, the district will follow its previ previously established process by posting a video of the meeting to the district's YouTube channel, Lex One video site, and our own website. I would like to let you know that we are in compliance with the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act, and we have notified the media of the date, time, and place of this meeting. And Ms. Hill, do we have any media here? No. I also would like to let you know that the district does tape this meeting for accuracy in preparing the minutes. Board, in front of you, you have a, an agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as presented for the general session? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Second. And thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments regarding the agenda? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of the agenda as presented, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries, and it is unanimous. Uh, we're going to go to 10.0, which is the minute approval of the minutes of the May 5th, 2020 and the May 19th, 2020 board meetings. Board members, you received the minutes of the May 5th, 2020 and the May 19th, 2020 board meetings. Other than corrections that have already been received and made, are there any other corrections? I'm hearing none. The minutes will be accepted as presented, and if I could brag on... Miss Tracy Halliday, who has been trained by Miss Cheryl Layton this week. She did those by herself, so let's give her a round of applause. A lot goes into doing that. Okay, now 11.0, reports and action items from executive session. Do I hear a motion to approve 18 certified recommendations for the 2020-2021 school year? Madam Chair, I move the board accept Dr. Little and senior leadership's re team's recommendation for 18 certified positions for the 2020-21 school year. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Green. Um, at this time, I'd like to, let's see, Mr. Stacy, um, do you have access to a mic? Well, just I was going to see if there were any comments that you had about how many positions we have. You can tell me and I'll be glad to. How many positions do we have left to fill that we're still working on? Okay, we have 24 open positions and one administrative position. I think that's incredible. Let's give HR a round of applause because they've done a great job. They've done a lot of virtual interviews, and you haven't lived till you sat through a virtual interview, right, Mr. Stacy? So we now have a motion and a second on the floor. Are there any questions or comments, board, before we take a vote? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. Do I hear a motion to approve one administrative recommendation for the 2020-2021 school year? Madam Chair, I move the board accept the one administrative position recommendation by Dr. Little and the senior leadership team for the 2020-2021 school year. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Do we have a second? second. Okay, thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments regarding that one position? 
Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of approving the one administrative recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. Um, the board did, did uh, hear a, um, some information from our law firm regarding uh, some potential litigation. Do I hear a motion to retain a legal firm to represent the district as plaintiff party in the multi-district legal action against Jewel Labs concerning the vaping epidemic in our schools? Madam Chair, I move that the board retain the firm of Wagstaff and Cartmel to re represent the district as a plaintiff party in the multi-district legal action established in the federal court in California against e-cigarette maker Jewel Labs concerning what has become a vaping epidemic with our youth and in our schools. Okay, thank you, Ms. Green. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Are there any questions or comments regarding this potential litigation board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of join of uh, retaining the legal firm to represent our district as a plaintiff in this multi-district legal action, please say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? I'm okay. opposed. Okay, one opposed. Okay. The motion carries. It's six to one with uh, it, and the motion does carry. And we are now entering into that litigation. And I I would like to let you know that uh, Fort Mill has already voted to go in to uh, join this litigation. So um, I'm not sure if any other districts in the state, but we'll be joining Fort Mill. Uh, we just feel like, um, I think Ms. Rawls shared with me, it's just an absolute epidemic. And anything we can do to help our students, we, we really want to do that. So at this time, we're going to go to 12.0, which is special recognition. And let me move over here. And I would like to ask Dr. Little to step forward. And if you've been to any recent board meetings, you know we have not done this in a while, so this is really special. Um, usually when principals retire, schools host drop-ins in their honor, and we recognize them at district leadership team meetings with a special gift and lots of memories. In this unusual time, however, when we cannot gather in large groups, we celebrate their successes in different ways. Principals share their memories and messages in online groups and Zoom meetings, and tonight, while masked and practicing social distancing, we recognize them. Together, principals Brenda Nichols, and if you'll come forward as I call your name, Melissa Rawl, <laughs> yeah, so we're going to recognize Miss Brenda Nichols first. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to read this part, so stand there. Okay, we're going to recognize Brenda Nichols, Melissa Rawl, and Guy Smith, who have contributed more than 111 years of service to Lexington <laughs> Women. Okay, I'm going to read about Brenda, so let's see if we can make her blush. Brenda Nichols joined Rocky Creek Elementary when it opened in 2010. First as assistant principal, then she became principal in 2014. She has a very strong work ethic with high expectations of herself and her staff and is passionate about coding, providing quality learning opportunities for staff, and ensuring that all Rocky Creek students are prepared for the world of college and careers. She began her career as an elementary school counselor at Red Cliff Elementary in the Aiken County Public School District in 1990. She joined Lexington District 1 in 1993 as a fourth grade teacher at White Knoll Elementary. In 1999, she transferred to Lake Murray Elementary when it opened. Then she was promoted to assistant principal at Lake Murray Elementary in 2005, and she also served as a literacy coach. Brenda, we cannot thank you enough for your service, and we're, I'm sad to see you move on, but I know it's going to be exciting, so let's stand up and let's recognize Ms. Brenda Nichols. going to embarrass her a little more. I think you have some family members here, right? No. Oh, you're by yourself. Oh, I, I, I know Melissa has some family members. Miss Smith. Saw her, I saw her half back there. Miss Smith, I would just like to add that um, 
Miss Nichols and I used to walk to Girl Scouts together in elementary school, and I have to say that she is not old enough to retire because <laughs> we're the same age, and so I'm just going to say that right now. So. Now we're going to recognize Miss Melissa Rolfe, a graduate of Lexington High School, and so she has come full circle. She is a quiet, calm leader who began her teaching career in 1978 at Brooklyn Casey High School in Lexington II after graduating magna cum laude from the University of South Carolina. She moved to Airport High School in 1979 as a teacher and department chair and joined our district at Gilbert High School in 1997, serving again as teacher and department chair. In 1998, she moved to Lexington High, she came home, where she served as teacher and the district's secondary summer school coordinator before becoming an assistant principal in 2001, then principal in 2011. Her career is studied with, studded with awards. The 2018 South Carolina Athletic Administrators Association 5A Principal of the Year, the 2017 Lexington Rotary Club Lee Bullington Spirit Award, the 2014 Palmetto Center for Women Twin Award, the 2008 SCASA South Carolina Secondary Assistant Principal of the Year, the 2004 Army National Guard Recognition of Support, the 2000 Lexington High Teacher of the Year finalist, the 1994 Barbara H. James Award for Academic Teacher of the Year for Outstanding Contributions to and Support of Tech Prep, and the 1990 Airport High School Teacher of the Year. I think y'all will join me in saying we will really miss Melissa, but we wish her the best. Thank you. And your family's here. You want to say who's here with you? My very supportive husband is here, and my lovely daughter Anna and her husband as well. Oh, we're glad y'all came. We, and I know you're going to enjoy having more time with your mom. So, thank you, Melissa. Is that forty-one? Wow. Okay. A veteran educator, a graduate of Pelion High, and magna cum laude graduate of the University of South Carolina, Guy Smith's commitment to students is eclipsed only by his commitment to his staff. He began his education career in 1979 as a social studies teacher at Richland Northeast High School in Richland School District 2 and joined Lexington District 1 in 1981 as a social studies teacher at Pelion High School, where he taught social studies, served as department chair, and coached various sports, including tennis, junior varsity basketball, and varsity track. He received a promotion to the position of administrative assistant at Pelion Elementary School in 2000, and a year later was promoted to the position of assistant principal at Pelion Middle School. Another promotion in 2012 took him to the position of White Knoll Middle School Principal. He believes his time as White Knoll Middle School Principal has not just been a great honor, but also a genuine pleasure as he served the students, staff, and parents of the White Knoll community. Guy, we're gonna miss you and enjoy your retirement. Thank you. <laughs> How cool is it that all three of these retiring principals are also products of Lexington One School? I know. Isn't that great? <laughs> That's a rare thing. Thank you for your service <coughs> to this community. Okay, we're going to move on. We are now going to rec recognize someone who is near and dear to me that I could not have served on the board without her help for all these years. Cheryl Layton started working for Lexington School District 1 in 1993. She used a typewriter in the office and relied on carbon, carbon paper for making copies in a district that only had 14 schools. She served four superintendents in her tenure, including Dr. Chester Floyd, Mr. Joe Bonds, Dr. Karen Woodward, and now Dr. Greg Little. Her favorite part of the job has always been serving people. She takes pride in knowing that what sometimes started as a tense call or meeting with a parent community member or employee 
often later developed into a friendship. And I can honestly say that. I would have people call me and they'd say, oh, I, I'm just going to hang up with you and I'm going to call that Miss Layton lady because she's really good. She'll help me. <laughs> Cheryl looks forward to spending more time with her husband Charles, her four children, and seven grandchildren who live in various parts of the country. And there they are. And one of her daughters even flew in from Ohio. Oh, good. And her, we welcome her son via Facebook. She is also expanding her self-described she shed so she can do more sewing, crafting, and painting. And she just told me she's going to make me a new mask, so I'm going to count on that. I will tell you that she is our board's right hand. When Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers, he perfectly described Cheryl. We will miss you, Cheryl. I can't, mm. <laughs> He wouldn't do this. He said, Miss Smith, you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. We all are. my husband Charles. Um, my eldest daughter Andrea, she lives in Gilbert and our, her children go there. Um, my daughter Jackie, uh, she came from the Cincinnati area. She's a respiratory therapist and there's two of her children with her. Um, my daughter Lindsay um, and her son Kingston and he is um, going to Lexington one at Lexington Middle next year. Um, those are most of my grandchildren. My son is, is on FaceTime. He's in San Diego. She ran oh. up well, I, she's got her, her work cut out for you, a lot to do with that family. So we love you, and thank you all for sharing her with us. It's been a true pleasure. Okay. Okay. Let me get, back my, get my mask back on and get situated. We are now at agenda item 13.0, which is citizens' participation. And I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Judy, Julie, come on up. Well, Greg, you look like Miss America there. She's coming. She's going to rescue you. Okay. Maybe not. Thanks for your patience. Um, I am here on behalf of the Lexington One Educational Foundation, and I'm excited to be here to present the actual um, Joseph M. Biedenboe Administrator of the Year Award. Um, the foundation established this in 2005, um, and it was it re recognizes each year an effective and a deserving administrator who currently serves in Lexington One while also honoring an esteemed administrator from the district staff of 1952, who was Mr. Joseph M. Biedenboe. He worked for the district for 36 years as a seventh grade math teacher, a principal, and an assistant superintendent for federal and personnel programs. And he was also a World War II veteran and who served in the U.S. Air Force. He retired in 1983, but he remained very active in our district for many years. 
and we honor him each year when we present this award on behalf of the foundation. And sadly, he passed away last year. His son, Mackie, was unable to join us um, tonight due to COVID-19, um, you know, precautions, but he did ask me to um, share his congratulations with the award winner. So on to the award for this year. Um, the 2020 recipient of the Joseph M. Biedenbo Administrator of the Year Award has exhibited outstanding leadership and loyalty to education in Lexington School District 1 for more than 20 years as a teacher, a district coordinator, an assistant principal, and a principal. The individual is passionate and dedicated and builds intentional connections with students, teachers, and staff to empower them to be their very best. The individual exemplifies school spirit and good sportsmanship and truly loves all areas, including academics, athletics, and the arts. The winner has a constant smile, a supportive and encouraging attitude, and celebrates successes and personal growth. The individual is strong, graceful, and kind, and demonstrates leadership both in the school and outside of it and the district. It is for all these reasons and for this person's outstanding commitment to excellence in education that I'm pleased to present the 2020 Joseph M. Biedenbo Administrator of the Year Award to Mrs. Melissa C. Rawl, Principal of Lexington High School. Congratulations, Melissa, on winning this prestigious award. We can think of no one more deserving than you. Congratulations, Melissa. This award is well deserved. Congratulations. Congratulations, Mrs. Roll, on your distinguished award. It is well deserved, and we are very proud of you. Right, congratulations on winning your award. You definitely deserve it. Congratulations. Hi, Ms. Roll. I wanted to congratulate you on getting the Administrator of the Year Award. I know that I could not have imagined doing eight years with any other principal. Congratulations, Ms. Rawl! Hi, Mrs. Rawl. I wanted to congratulate you for winning this award. I just have to tell you, your three P's of positivity, professionalism, and public relations have shaped Lexington High School for a decade and beyond. Congratulations, Melissa, on winning the Bidenbo Award. Um, you're well-deserving. You've done some great things here, and um, it's, it's just a well-deserved award. Congratulations. Hey, Ms. Rawl, I just wanted to congratulate you on winning the Bidenbo Administrator of the Year Award. I know it's kind of cliche to say it, but there's nobody more deserving. Congratulations, Melissa, on winning the Joseph Bidenbo Award. We are so glad that you are representing Lexington High School and winning this award. Congratulations. Congratulations, Ms. Rawl. You are so deserving of this award. We are so proud of you. Way to go, Wildcat. Congratulations, Ms. Rawl, on winning the Joseph Beanball Award. You are the most deserving person for this award because of how you treat your parents, your students, and your teachers. It has been an honor to work with you, and we will miss you so much next year.
I think we got her good. <laughs> Congratulations, Melissa. I know. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Ball, I'd Melissa. like to add, too, that during the Lexington High School graduation, which was absolutely beautiful, when you did the alma mater, I'm not even a graduate from Lexington One, and I cried. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for all your service. Mm -hmm. I agree. And she also has the best shoes of anybody in the district. <laughs> we always look forward to graduation to see which shoes Melissa's going to wear to graduation because they're always stunning. Well, if, um, if anybody would like to leave, I know we're in a transition time, and I know several guests, you might not want to stay for the rest of the meeting, but we're going to move on, so feel free if anybody wants to get up and move around. That We will not penalize you for that. Um, we're now going to go to 13.0, which is citizens participation. <clears throat> I have not received any cards. Would anybody like to address the board? Okay, if you don't mind, I'm not, it's a long thing. I'm not going to read it if no one's going to address us. So we'll keep moving if everybody's okay with that. So we're now going to go to 14.0, which are action items. And 14.1 is the third reading of the 2020-2021 proposed general fund budget. We just had our public hearing prior to this meeting, and Mr. Salters, our chief financial officer, presented the third reading, which was the final reading, and tonight we will vote whether or not we're going to adopt this budget. So do I hear a motion to approve the 2020-2021 general fund budget as presented? Madam Chair, I move that the board approve the third reading of the general fund budget for fiscal year 2020-2021 as recommended by the administration. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Powers. Um, board, are there any questions or comments before we take a vote? I just have some comments. Um, first, I just want to thank Mr. Salters um, and your staff again for the hard work that y'all put into this budget. Um, and also, thank you for spending hours outside of this meeting um, gathering information and answering all of my questions. Uh, to the board, I just wanted to say I do not believe that the district is legally restricted from providing step increases. Um, some districts truly can't make up the difference, uh, but Lexington One is not one of those. Um, and if it hadn't been for the School Boards Association and a couple of other organizations asking the General Assembly to suspend step increases, uh, we may not even be having this discussion. Um, we're increasing class sizes. When we're asking everyone to do more, and we're telling them how much they are appreciated, but we aren't showing them. Um, as a board, I think we need to be asking for options. Um, this is what the budget looks like with a step increase. This is what the budget looks like with an increase in pay for substitutes. This is what the budget looks like with both. Um, instead, we just have a budget. Uh, Molly Spearman reiterated the importance of subs when schools reopen, yet no one can remember the last time sub pay was increased. Um, in addition, I talked about board approved fees and how schools spend those fees. Um, since then, I've learned that the same issues exist with other um, fees that are collected. Um, in more than one instance, cash was dispersed out of these pupil activity accounts. Um, if I'm going to approve a fee, then I need to be able to tell someone that I'm confident that their fee for, well, just say instructional materials, actually went towards instructional materials. Um, at this time, I can't do that. And if they were to send in a FOIA request for how fees were spent, um, I don't think they would even be happy with the answers that they got. So um, I would just like some options and some more details on fees and some other things. Okay, thank you, Ms. Garris. Are there any other questions or comments, board? I think uh, Ms. Green and I were talking during the break. Um, right now, we, are, we have our hands tied, and we really can't do anything till the General Assembly comes back in September. And... Uh, the community is just really struggling. Um, I know so many families that they've lost, uh, they've lost their jobs, they've lost their livelihoods, and uh, I just feel really proud that at this point we have kept all of our staff and teachers employed. They've kept their benefits, they've kept their pay, um, and uh, I was pleased that we could do that during this time. So we're just going to watch and we're going to follow the guidance of the General Assembly and. Governor McMaster, and uh, we're just going to pray a lot because there's a lot going on in our community. Ms. Uh, Smith, I would just like to add, um, 
my appreciation to uh, Mr. Salters and his uh, team for um, what I consider to be a very responsible budget um, in light of just we've got we're in the middle of some uncertainty. We don't know what um, the General Assembly is going to do as far as funding schools in September. Um, right now we're under a continuing resolution, which is um, basically same as last year until they decide otherwise. Um, and um, a lot can happen between now and September. And I think that this budget represents um, a lot of belt tightening, but a lot of responsible um, planning um, so that in the event that things are worse or considerably worse in the fall when the budget is um, passed, that we're in a position um, to be able to um, continue to provide the services that we need to provide to our students and um, keep our teachers' um, jobs secure. So thank you, Mr. Salters. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or comments, board? Um, hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of the 2020 2020-2021 general fund budget as presented by Mr. Salters and the finance team. Uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Jay is opposed. Okay. So it's six to one and the motion carries and we have a budget and guess what? For all my school teacher friends, that means you get a paycheck. <laughs> That's always a good thing. We have to keep that budget going. Um, we're now going to move to 14.2, which is our second reading on policy BEC executive session open meetings. Um, I'm going to call on, uh, let me get a motion on the floor in a second and then I'll call on Ms. Hill. Do I have a motion to approve policy BEC executive session open meetings as presented with the changes? Madam Chair, I move that the board approve policy BEC executive sessions open meetings as presented. Okay, thank you, Ms. Green. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Are there any questions or comments regarding this proposed, these changes to this policy? I have some questions. Um, during first reading, there were four words that were changed and a sentence was added that allowed board members attending by Zoom to view the materials electronically. And there was no discussion from the board. I'm just curious who added two additional paragraphs between um, the first meeting and this meeting? I ask that those um, paragraphs be added um, just because as we continue to navigate um, electronic dispersal of documents. Um, documents that we view in executive session are confidential and um, they need to be maintained in a confidential setting. Um, those documents don't belong to the board members, they belong to the district. Um, and so this is just an effort to make sure that um, the data and you know, contract negotiations and legal advice and uh, student and personnel information is protected um, in the best manner that we can. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so we have one, we have some policies that are over 30 years old. Um, and like you mentioned, this policy is in direct response to an email that I sent to you and Cindy um, when I mentioned that I had asked for um, some documents from a Zoom meeting that I did not have time to read because they were not provided in a timely manner and they were removed from the folder before I had a chance to finish. Um, but as board members, we are to hold the district accountable um, but it's hard to do that without a paper trail. And I asked board members from other districts and they're allowed to keep information that's given to them in executive session. Um, I just believe this policy shows a lack of trust between board members. Um, and it's no different than when parents had their information taken from them after the committee meeting that discussed reopening. Um, and for us to be in the midst of a pandemic and instead of acting on updates from recommended policy from the school boards association, um, we'd rather focus our efforts on keeping information out of the hands of fellow board members. Um, I, I just th think we need to re-examine our priorities. Okay, thank you, Ms. Garris. Are there any other questions or comments, board? I, I do have one. I, I do struggle a little bit with the language, uh, the, the additional language with uh, will be collected by the chair, his or her designee at the conclusion of executive session. I have a hard time reconciling how we can receive, say, a contract for purchase, you know, for, for a property. Um, and we may not receive that until 6 p.m. and then kind of be expected to vote on it very soon thereafter. Or if not, if it's pushed later, um, at least not have the chance to review 30, 40, 50 pages worth of legal documentation. 
that's awful difficult to try to do inside of a, you know, an hour in which we're also trying to cover employee recommendations and so on and so forth. And I think moreover, I have more difficulty with the actual process of this policy development because in my mind, this is the way in which we govern ourselves mm -hmm. as the board. Mm -hmm. And so I would think we would board lead that mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, an employee of the district bringing this to us to, now if it's in a, in a facilitatory manner, I mean, it's, you know, I understand that, but I would anticipate that if we're going to adopt a policy in the way in which we govern ourselves, that we're going to lead that process. And, and it may not even have to be, you know, a seven member panel at one time, but moreover, like a little subcommittee or something like that, that, that reviews these policies. Grading policy, no, okay. I, we have no business doing that, we're not educators. But when it comes to things that, where we govern ourselves as a board, to me, that should be more board led. Um, so at this point, I would just make a motion to table this uh, for further consideration. And I don't know if I can second, us, but I agree with you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Guyton, because um, this language um, addition was at my request, but this is the first time that really it's been under discussion. So I think it would be um, uh, appropriate to give everybody a chance to marinate on it and mull it over. And um, there, it's, there's not really any urgency in this, sure. um, but I wanted to get this in it so that we, like you said, so that we can discuss it um, and consider, you know, the practical application. Because as Ms. Garris said, um, I think at any point in time, any documents that we review in executive session, that a board member can come to the district office and sit and view them at any at any point in time. Um, I just think that we need to be careful about how they um, documents are, um, leave the building. Um, and you're right; the board members um, should be trusted, and I think can be trusted. Um, but we just need to make sure that we have some procedures in place. But we can't really create procedures for that if there's not a policy that governs those procedures. Mm -hmm. And so the policy needs to come first. And so that's why I put this language here, and then we we can kind of parse it and figure it out. So I would second your motion to table today. But I also disagree with coming to the district office to view materials. I mean, there's no reason that those can't be made available um, electronically. And in here you say they'll be marked confidential. And you say they can't be duplicated, recorded, photographed, videoed. So I mean, you, you're covering all of that. It's kind of like we have to come here and be babysat by the district to make sure that we're not doing something we're not supposed to be doing when actually it's the other way around like we are here to hold them accountable they don't hold us accountable but by law there are privacy restrictions and i totally get that but this does not cover any of that we have foia covered all of that we have other policies covering that but to keep documents out of hands of fellow board members to me is just was almost unbelievable but not really I think we have a, a motion on the floor and a, a second to pin this. So at this point, since we have not voted, uh, let's let's go ahead and take a vote on uh, pending this until our main July meeting. And uh, since this was brought forward by the board, this has the this was not brought forward by administration. This was brought forward by the sure. board, and this is about self governance. So at this point, um, I have a motion from Dr. Guyton and a second from Ms. Green to pin this until our July meeting. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, we will pin this, and so we will not take a vote on the motion since we have pinned it. So it will move. So, Ms. Holliday, if you'll make sure this goes on the main July meeting. Okay, at this time, we're going to uh, go to 14.3, which is the Minority Business Enterprise Plan, and um, the Mr. Salters will be chiming in on this. So do I hear a motion to approve? The Minority Business Enterprise Plan for Fiscal Year 2020-2021 is recommended by administration. Madam Chair, I move the board approve the Minority Business Enterprise Plan for Fiscal Year 2020-2021 as recommended by the administration. Okay, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do I have a second? Second. And thank you, Dr. Powers. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Salters for any comments, or, and then we'll open it up for questions. Mr. Salters? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the board, just confirming you can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a minority business um, enterprise plan that we bring uh, to the board uh, each year at this time. Um, and this plan is, is part of our, um, 
our, our procurement process, and um, the plan uh, sets out a, a goal for the district um, and the guidelines associated with achieving that goal uh, related to minority business. Um, the, uh, the goal uh, for the district is that one half of 1% of the total budgeted budget expended by the district from procurement of supply services and construction um, may be directed towards minority vendors. Uh, and, and that is of the, um, what we call uh, controllable uh, dollars in our budget. And so um, that dollar goal, um, as an example, for the 2019-20 school year was approximately $460,000. Um, and that, that dollar amount will be determined uh, through a, a formula provided by the state. Um, it, it usually happens uh, later in the fall of the year after the, um, you know, the budget's loaded and everything's finalized and the state releases that formula and we apply that to our budget to, de to determine that goal. Um, and so um, our process in procurement related to minority business, uh, we have a um, MBE website that we go to uh, when we have solicitations that we release for the district um, that the state maintains and we um, identify any, of, any vendors that are participating that would match up with that uh, particular solicitation and send them that information uh, for bidding purposes uh, to try to help achieve uh, this goal. Um, one thing that we have always done in the, in the district um, is uh, we have committed to uh, the taxpayer that we're not going to pay more um, for goods and services uh, just to meet a goal. Uh, we're always going to, in our bids, uh, take the, the, the cheapest price um, available uh, to save taxpayer dollars. And so um, that's why um, there, there are years, actually uh, more years than not, where we haven't achieved this goal because oftentimes the um, open market bears a, a better price. Um, but we do set this every year, um, and this motion is, is that action. So I'll ha have to answer any questions. Okay. Are there any questions or comments for Mr. Salter? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of the Minority Business Enterprise Plan for fiscal year 2020-2021, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. We're now going to go to 14.4, which is which on the agenda is changes to 2020-2021 academic calendar. Dr. Talley was going to present that. And uh, at this time, board, we will not take action on this agenda item uh, because of some changes recommended by the uh, Accelerate Ed. But I am going to ask Dr. Talley if uh, she'll comment on this just so we'll know exactly where we are on this. It's not on. Lights on. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the board, for the opportunity to uh, explain why um, I would like to table this action item regarding um, revisions to the 2021 school academic school calendar. Um, as you know, Superintendent Spearman has uh, suggested that there be funding allowed for five additional days for teachers in grades. K-4 through 8. She's calling those days, the uh, recommendations of the Accelerated Task Force is, uh, those days are LEAP days, which stand for learning, assessing, um, remediation, and um, analyze, I think. Anti-analyzing and what's the P? Uh, planning? Planning, thank you. <laughs> so, the, a decision has not been made regarding funding for those days. So we're not guaranteed that um, we'd be paid, we'd be given funding for those days. In addition to that, school districts certainly can uh, extend those days to grades uh, to high school if they have the funding. It's a very large number, uh, as you know, to pay for those five extra days. 
So we would like to uh, wait until we have some more finality on the addition to the, uh, the five days. We would like, though, to go ahead and post uh, the calendar as it is written so that our parents and our community know that right now our intention is to start school the first day for students on August the 18th. Families need to know that. They have uh, travel plans made and other plans made. So uh, that will be posted back on our website so that families can do that. And then we can, once we have more information, we can certainly, um, certainly make changes to the calendar. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, I would like to remind everyone that uh, just today we have called a special call board meeting on July 2nd because that will follow the recommendation from Superintendent Spearman. At 8 a.m., we will have a special call board meeting to finalize the calendar, hopefully. That's right. <laughs> Things are changing so quickly, so um, there will be a quick meeting that morning to hopefully honor that. So thank you, Dr. Talley. Thank any you. questions or comments for Dr. Talley? Is there any feedback on when the five days would be? Would they start the year earlier? Or Actually, would they they have, that's a great question. Uh, you, you have the flexibility, um, Dr. Powers, to use those days any time in the first semester. They have to be used before uh, December, the end of December. They encourage you to use them um, earlier than later. And they also ask you to consider the needs in your community. And but that, there's, there's flexibility on the five days. And that requirement will be discordant from the legislature determining the funding for those days or not, or, or it'll be coordinated or, or yet to be determined. Yet to be determined, that's right. Okay. I will point out to you, though, uh, we've worked really hard to um, the changes that we will probably recommend uh, uh, if the funding does go through is, very, is not disruptive to this calendar. This is a very good calendar. Uh, we were asked last year to build a calendar that included lots of breaks at that time because we were talking about flu. And uh, Nurse Amy told us that families need a long weekend to recover from that. So it's a good calendar. We have tried to space uh, breaks uh, in most every month. So it's also a national election year. So we'll have a break in November for that holiday. So again, we're trying to be nimble. Uh, as you know, things are changing every day. So, uh, but we look forward to bringing changes to you uh, soon. And Dr. Talley, kind of following up on Dr. Power's question, I know in the, um, and you may not know this yet, um, but in the accelerated um, recommendations, um, they were not very um, certain in their recommendations. They kind of recommended a little bit of everything, um, yes, especially <laughs> when it came to calendar. Um, and there did seem to be a little bit of an emphasis on possibly delaying start until after Labor Day. Um, and my question is, I mean, are you, I think y'all usually do, and I, this may come later in the um, reopening presentation, but um, are we working to coordinate our count? I know we're not in lockstep, but coordinate generally with our neighboring school districts because we have teachers that have students that go in other districts, and um, th there's just a lot of um, need for some consistency within yeah. the Midlands area. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I mean, are you – sensing that the other districts in the Midlands are sticking to their generally published previous calendars if, like we Dr. are? Dr. Talley, if I could jump in on that question just to say, because there, there's some things that I know about this a little bit. Um, tomorrow, we'll be meeting with the Midlands superintendents, and that's going to be on as part of one of our, our topics of discussion. So we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. Um, we do try to try to do something along those lines because we have so many people that live here, work there, kids go to different districts, those kinds of things. Um, but again, we're gonna have to do what's best for our community. But we're, if, if y'all don't mind, I, I'd really like to get to the next big thing because that, that's gonna be the, the we're still kind of hypothetical on the calendar, but uh, we've got some, with, with the plants next, we'll kind of start clarifying some of the needs of the calendar too, I think. But we are talking about that very thing uh, tomorrow. Great. But I have one question. Are we gonna put this calendar back on the website now? Yes. Okay, I just know a bunch of people have been Going to the website saying they can't find it. Okay, thank y'all. Okay, thank you, Dr. Thank, Talley. Thank you. Do we need a motion to table this? For no. Later or no? Mm -hmm. We're not okay. taking action on it. Okay, at this time we're going to go to reports, and there's this is board, this is for information only, and I think this is why most people are here tonight. 
So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Little, and Dr. Little, if you'll take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. So um, I must say this is going to be a unique uh, superintendent's update because there is a, a lot of things that I think many superintendents, if you would have said uh, a year ago, you're going to have to be tackling these types of issues, it would be quite the surprise, and, and, and as it has been. Uh, before we get started tonight, I do want to say uh, some words that have, have really framed our efforts is we wanted to be purposeful, we wanted to be strategic, and we wanted to be intentional about our work. And our goal, and when you look across the board, our goal is to maximize face-to-face -face time and have a strong instructional program for our students. And at the same time, it's a both and for us, and at the same time, have um, a safe and secure environment to minimize risk for our employees, our students, and our community at large. And so there's been lots of work about uh, this effort. Uh, two of those people are back here, but I think they would even uh, admit that we have had, uh, really right now it'd be too long a list to count about people who are, who've been working on this plan and who have been um, a part of the work that we're doing. But um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Phillips uh, are gonna present tonight about where we're going. But again, I want you to keep, them, keep the words in mind, purposeful, strategic and intentional. And that our goal is to maximize that face-to-face -face time while looking after the health and safety of our students, of the adults in the building, and our community at large. Uh, so those are the big, those are the big takeaways, uh, the, the framing things that we've been working on. I would also say, I, I would be remiss to, to say even that tonight we're calling this our plan. I think we're referring to it as our framework with the knowledge and understanding that in the next month, the world could look different. Lee, look, look differently. Sorry, Melissa's gone already. I, she and I, I found out tonight, she and I both shared the fact we both made a C in English 102. Just don't want to throw that out there to everybody. But, but the world could be, very, it could be a very different place in a month from now. And, and how that looks then at the beginning of school is still up in the air. But... Um, I am thankful for the people who worked on this, for the creative energy. Uh, we do have a number of those folks over, th over there, and um, they may not want to raise their hand because they have to own some of this stuff, but um, I am thankful for their work. Um, but it was really about a collective effort of bringing this together, and I think what you're going to see tonight are some solutions that, that really meet uh, our community needs. So take it away, Dr. Smith. So this evening, I'll be presenting to you um, re-entry schedule options for K-12 students here in Lexington County School District 1. To create these options, we convened a, a group of school administrators at each grade level, well, I should say grade band, from across the district to draft initial scheduling options for re-entry. Members of individual divisions and departments across central services also supported our drafting team as we developed our plans and framework. Both the drafting team and central service um, administrators studied a number of re-entry plans from across the country to inform our design. Once the first draft of schedules was produced, we asked for feedback from loads and loads of stakeholders across our district. I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Phillips for a couple of minutes to discuss that process. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Oh, is this working? Did I do it? Okay. So we did not act, uh, the task force did not act in isolation. We did seek feedback um, from a variety of sources. We gathered feedback from uh, many of our stakeholders, including parents, students, uh, the medical community, uh, teachers, nurses. Um, we, we did uh, a variety of, used a variety of instruments. We used um, a pulse survey from Hanover Research, which uh, we sent out to all parents um, and asked them to have students do it as well. We did it, uh, the same mm -hmm. survey for school and district level staff. And we got up to almost 4,000 parents, 189 student responses, uh, over 1,500 school level staff and 174 district level staff on that. We did a lessons learned survey to, to try to get information from our stakeholders about how things went 
during um, the closure with regard to um, the remote learning process. And we focused those surveys on established groups within the district, like the Teacher Leadership Council and um, the uh, st staff advi uh, support staff advisory and some central services folks. Um, beyond that, Josh, <laughs> I did it. There we go. Okay. Uh, after that, we also uh, conducted focus groups with parents, doctors, students, teachers, nurses, and support staffs to show them uh, some of the proposed models, get their feedback on how those can be improved uh, upon. We also conducted um, a thought exchange, and many of you may have participated in that, uh, sort of a different approach, uh, more of a, less of a survey and more of a virtual town hall where people could express their thoughts and then uh, rate the thoughts of others. And, and what that allowed us to do was get those, most, those thoughts that were most popular sort of floated up to the top. And we had a tremendous response to that. Um, 8,600 uh, or so parents or guardians and 2,400 staff. And in the parents alone, we had over 300,000 uh, ratings of um, comments. So that was, that was some interesting data as well. And what came out of all of this feedback were basically two differing views. So we have a, a, a group of folks who are very, very concerned about returning to a face-to-face -face reopening because of the safety of students and staff. And then on the other side, you have those who are, have a desire to return uh, to school as normally as possible with the inclusion of some reasonable precautions. <clears throat> what we found, though, is that there are areas in which both of those groups agree. And this is where we sort of focused a lot of our efforts and where things align. So if we are remote, folks believe that new learning must take place. It must be structured learning. So there needs to be some, some schedule, some structure to that instruction. We need clear communication about our plans and about um, expectations for students, for staff, et cetera. Um, any schedule that's developed needs to be reasonable and needs to have flexibility and options. So parents need to have the option of a remote or virtual learning experience or a hybrid experience or a face-to-face -face experience. And then, um, of course, cleaning and hygiene and sanitization of all the um, buildings and equipment. They also agreed that we needed to take efforts to manage teacher workload because we're asking teachers to do a lot of different things now. Lowering class sizes to facilitate um, social distancing. Establishing clear expectations for staff, families, students, et cetera, in, in the environment that we're living in. Um, there was a lot of concern about teacher attendance. So um, how are we going to deal with um, absences if a teacher has to go out and our subs going to be readily available? Those things that uh, Mr. Stacy's office is, is working with. Um, teachers wanted to make sure they were going to have the support and time to prepare for whatever models we established. And they wanted a quick development and communication of a plan. So these are those areas where that we had common ground where those sort of two differing groups of folks said, whatever we do, we got to do these things. So I'm going to turn it back over to Natalie uh, because she did the lion's share of the work with the task force here and let her talk to you about those models. So based on the feedback from our stakeholder groups, we have developed Reentry plans, again, like I said, across grade bands. To begin with, we'll look at our elementary options. For students in kindergarten through grade five, we're going to offer families, or we are suggesting that we offer families two options for reentry in the fall. That would be the family model and the home-based model. 
Guardians of students will have the opportunity to select which of these choices they would think is best for their family and their children this summer. We're going to present information about both tonight. And we'll begin with the family model first. So our goal in the family model was twofold. We wanted to protect students and staff members' health while also maximizing instructional time and support, as Dr. Little described in the beginning. In this model, instructional time is maximized with all students attending school each day during scheduled school hours. In addition, we believe that as our community continues to reopen and as parents and guardians return to work, that this model best supports the homeschool partnerships that we have been developing while also effectively addressing student growth academically and socially. The family model treats homerooms or homeroom classes like families. And as a part of that family, students will remain in one classroom throughout the school day, with the exception of recess and other outdoor instruction. Students are not required to practice social distancing or wearing face coverings while in that family model classroom. This means that related arts teachers and other support staff teachers will come to students' family model classrooms to conduct their course or to take students outside. It also means that visiting teachers like related arts teachers and support staff teachers will wear, will wear personal protective equipment like face masks during those class experiences. Students will enjoy recess opportunities with their classmates only, and schools will serve breakfast and lunch in the classroom setting. In the family model, students will have learning and social experiences listed on the screen. This includes, of course, English language arts, math, science, and social studies. They will also have multiple recess breaks and frequent movement breaks throughout the day, as well as opportunities for social and emotional learning. In addition, if a teacher team teaches across multiple sets of students, teachers will move between classrooms and students will remain in their homeroom class. This, for instance, this is how our immersion programs in elementary school would function. Again, our adult staff would be wearing PPE or personal protective equipment if they were to move classrooms. So as we were planning the family model option, we specifically wanted to address how support services would be um, given to children as they need. These services include special education, gifted and talented, school counseling, response to intervention, English as a second language, and other school-specific supports. We are suggesting that schools use both a push-in and a pull-out model to provide these services to children. In both of these, in, whether it's a push-in or a pull-out, our teachers will be wearing personal protective equipment. And I did want to kind of name some of what those models could look like. So, uh, if, if teachers are pushing in to a family model classroom, they would be working for a small, with a small group while in the class with their homeroom teacher, and they would be wearing PPE at the time. You might also have a staff member come to a class and pull an individual student out to do, to do individual conferring. Again, the staff would be wearing PPE. The staff might also pull a small group of children from the same homeroom class or family model classroom. Again, the staff would be wearing PPE. And finally, if needed, uh, staff may pull children from multiple classrooms. But in cases of that, both the staff and students would be wearing personal protective equipment, and they would be practicing social distancing as much as possible. So in order to support this family mo model option, we also review the start and stop time for the school day. So typically in elementary schools in the past, school started around 7.40 a.m. in most sites and ended at 2.20 p.m. Please note that our suggested start and stop time for the coming school year will be different. We are suggesting that elementary schools start at 7.50 a.m. and end at 2 p.m. We believe this slightly shortened day will allow schools to stagger both entry into the building as well as dismissal from the building in the best way possible to keep children and staff safe. In order to help young children practice these procedures for social distancing and the staggered entry and dismissal, our team wanted to recommend that elementary students should transition back into school that first week in an incremental fashion. So what this means as a whole school, like in the whole school context, 
is that half of the student body would come on days one and two. The second half of the school would come days three and four, and then all children would be there on day five. Each school would provide specifics to guardians regarding the start date for their specific children or family. So from a teacher's perspective though, this means that half of his or her class would be there again on day one and two, the other half there on days three and four, with the full class there on day five. And that, is that just the first week or that's ongoing? Just the first week. Okay. So student and staff safety is, was vitally important in our planning and we believe it should be um, kept paramount as we continue to make decisions. So we wanted to make sure you understood that we were gonna be using or, or using and creating guidance from the CDC and from DHEC, as well as our district's operations and human resources departments to address instances when a student or staff member were to um, test positive for COVID-19. In these cases, though, instruction will not stop. We will continue to provide quality learning experiences for our children in a distance learning format during any time of quarantine. Because of that last statement, I wanna, wanna make sure I explain to you the next thing. So distance learning Wednesdays. In our end of year work plan reviews with administrative teams and school leadership teams, they repeatedly mentioned how collaborative and resilient both our educators and students were during the spring closure. But the other kind of theme in the conversation has been how hard it has been for our teachers to brainstorm, design, and execute distance learning in such a tight turnaround. So to ensure that quality instruction for all children, both in the face-to-face -face and distance learning environment, our team believes it's critical to provide teachers with time. Time to collaborate and time to plan, engaging experiences for children around new learning. This is why we are advocating for elementary teachers to have distance learning days every other week. The distance learning Wednesdays ensure educators have time to collaborate, plan, and design learning experiences that support our children in becoming effective communicators, collaborators, creators, and critical thinkers. These Wednesdays will also give educators consistent access to professional learning that they need to develop technical and adaptive skills. And finally, distance learning Wednesdays will give them time to engage in parent conferences so that we can figure out the supports they need both in school and out of school. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there is also a home-based model. And in the home-based model, instruction will be provided virtually through a variety of formats with accountability measures in place for progress monitoring and academic growth. We will also be providing virtual support services and social emotional learning supports in a variety of formats such as telephone calls, emails, and virtual platform meetings like Zoom or Google Hangout. So for students in grades 6 through 12, we will offer two options for reentry in the fall, the AB hybrid schedule and a virtual instruction model. Guardians of students, again, will have the opportunity to select which of these schedules best fits their family and their children later this summer. We will present information about both, and we will start with the hybrid schedule. So in a hybrid schedule model, students will be assigned to either a cohort A group or a cohort B group to support social distancing. For students, this means that they will have two days of face-to-face -face instruction, and three days of virtual learning each week. In the face-to-face -face instruction, teachers are, will still be using our district's instructional model, which we call student, the student engagement model. On those face-to-face -face days, they will still have many lessons, they still will have small group differentiated instruction, and they still will engage in individual conferring. On virtual days, educators will use structures that empower children to be leaders of their own learning. Content and learning on virtual days will be a continuation of what they had done in the face-to-face -face environment previously. To support student growth, school, schools will schedule virtual opportunities for students to work with their teachers in real time to address academic and social needs. 
In addition, teachers will design and schedule virtual peer collaboration opportunities for students to continue their work in a group setting. So at the middle level, the AB hybrid schedule will have seven periods each day when students are in a face-to-face -face, um, group. Please note that the start and stop time for middle school has been adjusted for the 2021 school year as well. Currently, our middle schools start, like this year, our middle schools started at 8.05, typically, and ended around 3.30. For next year, we are, we are recommending that middle school start at 9 a.m. and end at 4.15 p.m. From the student perspective, the AB hybrid schedule provides them with a well-rounded middle school experience. Each student has a rich course of study that includes four core classes, two exploratory classes, and one advocacy period. To aid in the social distancing aspects, the team built in 10 minute transition times between classes and is recommending staggered class changes. This time period presents schools with the opportunity to design the safest transition plan possible at each grade band. All periods in this schedule will be 55 minutes with the exception of period two, which was made longer for non-instructional class tasks like ordering lunch. From the teacher perspective, core teachers will teach four classes and have two dedicated periods, one for planning and one for virtual support of students. Exploratory teachers will have five classes and provide support to their virtual day cohort when they are not with students in a face-to-face -face setting. Specialized programs and supports, again, in this model will be uh, still possible. Students who receive response to intervention, English as a second language, or special education supports will still have access to these services on face-to-face -face and virtual days. Students who need this added layer of intervention may attend pull-out services for special ed, uh, response to intervention, or ESOL in lieu of one of their exploratory classes, or they may be uh, eligible for additional supports. This allows all children to have at least one exploratory class. Furthermore, students will experience differentiation through accelerated coursework like they always have, and immersion students will continue to take a language and passport class under this model. Lastly, the advocacy period and lunch would be combined. This allows for more face-to-face -face instructional time when students are in the building while providing social-emotional support as well as time for children to decompress with their peers in the advocacy setting. So for middle school, well, secondary teachers as a whole, we are recommending virtual learning Wednesdays. Like the elementary model plan, these same teachers need time to provide virtual student supports, to collaborate and plan engaging student experiences, and to engage in rich professional learning. For secondary teachers in particular, we felt like this was important because they are changing from a primarily face-to-face -face instructional model to one that is hybrid. These Wednesdays would occur each week. We believe that these virtual learning Wednesdays ensure educators have the quality time they need to collaborate with one another to design hybrid learning experiences and supports that empower children to be effective communicators, collaborators, creators, and critical thinkers. In addition, these Wednesdays give educators consistent access to the professional learning they will need to develop the technical and adaptive skills for hybrid and virtual learning. So in order to support all students and families in a hybrid environment as described, our team is recommending that students have multiple contacts from school staff during the three virtual days, easing parents' concern if their child is at home. Each day, teachers will have a dedicated period where they will be available for virtual office hours this allows educators to provide instructional support and services to a cohort of students attending school that day in a virtual setting. In addition, students who need additional interventions will be given the supplemental support in the virtual setting, and school counselors and advocacy teachers may meet um, with children through virtual meetings. Students with siblings in the same school or in the same attendance area, including children and blended families, will be placed in the same co cohort, 
to ease childcare, transportation, and scheduling concerns. Lastly, we are investigating community partnerships that may provide relief for parents regarding child care concerns. So before we dig into the student perspective of the high school schedule, I wanted you to note again the, the uh, schedule time change for next year. This past year, our high schools typically started school around 8.20 a.m. and they would end around 3.30 p.m. For the 2020-21 school year, the draft team recommends that high schools start at 9 a.m. and end at 3.50 p.m. Additionally, the high school schedule has a similar structure to the middle school in that there are two cohorts or groups in which students could be scheduled. In the AB hybrid schedule for high school, students will typically take around six to eight credits over the course of the year, depending on graduation requirements. Students who travel to LTC or a center of advanced study were advising that they stay at one, those schools for the entire day if possible. We're also advising that course offerings remain the same with the addition of some 100% virtual options. And these um, course offerings will still include back, uh, international baccalaureate, advanced placement, and dual enrollment options that we have always had. To support families in transitioning to this model, again, we will ensure that siblings and individuals in the same household will be scheduled in the same cohort. This is, in, this is includes, excuse me, siblings that may go to a feeder middle school. So from the teacher perspective, in a high school, teachers would teach around 60 to 90 students per semester. Each group that they see in the face-to-face -face sitting would have around 10 to 16 students physically in the classroom. On Wednesdays, all students, again, would be virtual, like in the middle school, and teachers would host virtual office hours and support sessions on those Wednesdays. In addition, they would have time for collaborative planning and professional learning on virtual uh, platforms. On Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, teachers will have 75 minutes dedicated for virtual office hours for planning and virtual support of students. Some teachers may teach 100% virtually in this model, depending on the course offering and the number of student requests that we have for that. Something that I was very excited about and wanted to make sure was shared is that under this schedule, our children will still have access to a world-class career and technology education experience at Lexington Technology Center. The goal of this coursework will continue to be hands-on learning with real-life application. So the LTC will leverage a model that maximizes in-person hands-on learning so that students acquire the career-specific skills they need alongside mastering course content. Students who select to take courses at LTC will still have that option to earn career credits or certifications. Because some of these certifications are governed by outside agencies, the LTC will use the requirements of the certification to determine the schedule for that particular course. To support students in their endeavors to take courses at Lexington Technology Center, our draft team is proposing that core classes be offered to LTC for traveling students. Students that attend Lexington High School would continue to take their core classes at their home school. As a result of this change, the LTC will manage schedule conflicts and needs on a case-by-case -case basis should students have specialized coursework they need to complete for graduation. In addition, transportation will be, off, will be provided to the LTC. However, we are recommending that the um, routes between instructional blocks be limited or eliminated when possible. Students will still have the option to drive or to be dropped off and picked up as they always have in the past. So in closing around the AB hybrid schedule, I just wanted to highlight two things. First, the schedule addresses safety. It maximizes exposure by creating half occupancy in the building and classes each day. And it minimizes transitions and allows ample time for students to transition between classes. Additionally, staff may have atypical duties, which includes bathroom and hallway supervision, behavior coaching, and extra support to students as needed. 
As with the other models presented tonight, the district will work with local medical professionals, the CDC and DHEC to determine best safety protocols for entering, transitioning, and exiting the school, as well as the use of personal protective equipment. Second, the plan intentionally addresses students' need for social emotional support. Students are provided an, a social emotional support class each day that they are on campus through an advocacy period. In addition, teachers of this advocacy period will also provide a regular point of contact for families regarding check-ins and questions. So the virtual instruction option, option for families is the second opportunity or choice that a, a family could make. In the 100% virtual option, instruction will be provided through a variety of formats with accountability measures in place to ensure progress monitoring and student growth. Virtual support services and social emotional learning support will also be provided through a variety of formats like telephone calls, emails, and virtual platform meetings like Zoom and Google Hangout. So before I ended tonight, I would be remiss not to thank my team that I worked with over the past couple of weeks to develop these great well, these schedules. I want to thank the principals, assistant principals, and school staff listed here that served as our drafting team for the schedule options. I'm going to ask them to stand up if, they're, if they'd like to so that we can give them a round of applause for all of the hard work that they did. And when I say hours, it was hours and hours of study on their own, the different entry plans, as well as the work that I kind of harangued them to do when we met in, um, through Zoom and other um, meetings. So they did an amazing job in taking this feedback from stakeholder groups to ensure that our options met the needs of our children, staff, and families. Specifically, the drafting team correlated the stakeholder feedback with our options by intentionally using this feedback to clarify and revise our plans, we are confident that school schedule options that we presented to you tonight ensure the safety and security of our students and staff, maximize learning experiences for children, and provide social emotional supports that all students need while staying true to our mission and vision as a district. We could not have refined and produced these options without the support and work of the professionals listed here. We are definitely stronger together. So, at this time, if you have questions, I'd be glad to help. I, I just want to say thank you. I know a lot of work went into that. Um, wow, I'm not even sure what questions I have. <laughs> but I do know that, um, I know I will be bombarded with questions probably as soon as I leave here. I have for the last couple of weeks and all the way up until when I pull in the parking lot. Who do people call or email that would actually have some answers for them? So um, we are developing a website that will go live right after this meeting with the options and choices. And on that website, they will list um, the people that they need to contact should they have questions. So it'll all be on that website that'll be um, connected to the Lexington1.net site. Okay. Thank you all. And you may already have this plan for that website, um, but I think it would be very helpful um, to, a little bit like when we have a, um, like a building plan or a property purchase, maybe comp start compiling the FAQs yeah. and continually update those. But that way, because otherwise you'll get nine million of the same question. Right. Um, and like Ms. Garris, that this is the, what I've been asked about for the last six weeks. Um, and I, I mean, I just, I can't imagine how many hours y'all spent on this? Because you basically just, threw, I've told people, I think they like put everything on the table and just pick pieces and parts and tr just, I mean, y'all really crafted an entirely new school model. Um, and so thank you very much for the time that you put into this. Um, thank, thank you. you. Uh, one note, just that, um, just to be clear uh, about what our, what our intention is for the year. Uh, as the reality changes, so will this plan also be flexible. So I think our number one goal and our number one hope is that we're going back to school with, with no social distancing issues whatsoever. I mean, I think that is certainly our hope. Um, and perhaps, um, you know, if, if, if treatment or a vaccine or whatever else is, is generated this year, maybe that's a possibility. 
Um, but what we are really looking at is, is this to be, a, a, as Dr. Talley said earlier, a nimble plan. So if the reality changes, and let's say it maybe doesn't change for the good, then maybe we are going to be much better prepared this year to engage in a virtual or distance learning environment. And our commitment to our community is, is that the learning that you experienced in the fourth quarter of last year is not the same type of learning that you're going to experience distance-wise or virtually this year. Number one, we've invested heavily in time for our teachers to prepare, and I cannot tell you how important that is. We have to give our teachers time to think through this. Uh, I, I have told people that next year, every teacher in our district is a first-year teacher because they're doing things next year they've never done before, and we're gonna have to, we have to respect that and provide uh, these incredible professionals with the time they need to be successful. At the same time, we, we have to continue again to be nimble, and we have to ensure that if we are to go to a virtual learning environment for any length of time, say you have to shut down a school for two to five days, say, uh, say someone there's a quarantine or something along those lines, or the second wave and we have a, a, a much larger issue in the fall than we do today, any of those issues, we are going to be better prepared to switch to those virtual and distant learn, uh, distance learning environments. And again, last year our goal was to survive the fourth quarter. We were dealing with something we had never dealt with before. We had 72 hours to prepare. This year it's about thriving. This year it's about creating dynamic learning experiences. And this year it's about our students and our teachers finding incredible amounts of success and advancing. Uh, it's not just about let's hold what we've got and let's make it through the end of the year because we know we're dealing with all these things. Now it's about how do we best support our students as it moves forward because we could be in this model. I mean, we have two doctors here. We could be in this model 12 months. We could be in this model 18 months, 24 months, six months, whatever it may look like. Um, but again, our I goal is six. To, what's that? I vote six. Yeah, me too. I, I vote six too. Um, but just knowing that there's a lot of different ways this thing could go and we need to be prepared for any of them. And I think our model does that and we're going to have to switch back and forth. We may have to switch back and forth in those kinds of things. But the last thing I want to say as to what Dr. Smith uh, talked about and stressed throughout our thing, we will be working to create the absolute best way to minimize exposure to our teachers, our staff, and our students, um, and how that works, and, and who needs to be in PPE and who doesn't. At this moment, we don't necessarily believe that our students in the classroom will be wearing masks. I know that's a hot topic, and I, I, I wanted to announce that. I don't believe that's going to be in our model, but there may be some use of PPE when we talk about transition and moving throughout the building and those kinds of things. But uh, so we're trying to create this opportunity for our, for our young people and our, and our teachers, and the adults in our building, that everyone can be safe, but that we can also provide a dynamic learning environment so that they can be successful. I think from a, a, a medical perspective, um, we just have to acknowledge we don't know. I wish I could tell, sit here and tell you we know what the future looks like and what this viral infection is going to do. Um, we don't. We're better than we were three months ago. Uh, we'll be better three months from now. Um, but we don't know. What I do know um, is that there's probably not a person in this room who has not cried over the past three months. Mm -hmm. There's probably not a person watching this right now who has not cried. A parent who has been a foster parent, a grandparent who has been caught, cast into a role of teacher, um, a teacher who has been cast into a role of completely figuring out their job and, and how to do it. Um, and if you don't know that teaching is a calling, um, I'm here to tell you it is because I have had several sitting on my front porch crying because they can't see their kids. Um, so it's very real. On the flip side, we see the kids cry. They come through my office and no more do they say, I don't want to go to school. Um, they say, how can I go to school? I don't care what I have to wear. I will go to school. Um, we didn't know how this thing was going to start with, with coronavirus. We didn't know if we're dealing with the flu or if we're dealing with Ebola. We needed time to determine that. We got a little better handle. Um, 
in office testing will make a huge difference. Um, vaccination will make a tremendous difference. Um, and both of those are obviously in the pipeline. Um, I think this plan uh, makes the best of a bad situation at the end of the day. Um, this is from a medical perspective. It acknowledges the fact that you are not going to get a K through five to socially distance or wear a mask. You will not. <laughs> Trust me, I see plenty of them all day. It will not happen. Um, but it also acknowledges that there is a mental wellness side to the social experience a child has. Um, and that starts very early, but it's most important sixth grade and up. And so I think j just by allowing the face-to-face -face interaction as much as we can, I'd love to see more, Dave. But, you know, obviously there, there are so many time strengths and constrictions and everything else that have to go into play, and you have to honor the fact that teachers have to have time to prepare. Um, and so I, I think this plan is, is the best of the bad situation. Um, it's aggressive while conservative at the same time. And so um, appreciate the work all of you have done um, and uh, certainly look forward to August 18th. I was going to ask one more question. Um, so I think for the first time in that I can recall, our, it looks like um, like our middle schools and high schools, their schedules will be synced up. Um, is that Will that open the door for, say, like if for families that choose 100% virtual instruction, that there could be students from River Bluff and Lexington and Gilbert with the same teacher? I mean, it seems like you'll be able to consolidate some resources um, with this since everybody's got the same basically block schedule. Oh, is that part of your conversation? So yes, we are developing plans in terms of what a virtual academy would look like um, should families choose to go 100% virtual. And those FTE allotments are really gonna depend on the number of requests that we have in those sections. So high school in particular is, is a challenge because there are so many options that children can choose in terms of scheduling. But our team is, um, our scheduling team and the IT department are fantastic and we're working through ways to make that happen for kids. Uh, also know we have a, uh, you may have said this earlier, but we have a survey going out by the end of this week where we will be asking families if they are interested in the 100% virtual option. And so we're gonna be collecting that data as soon as we can and being able to turn that around then into the planning of what that ultimately looks like. But to your point, it's possible that you would have students from across the district in a one virtual classroom with a with the particular teacher. For the survey, um, and I know the survey is just gauging interest, um, but once a, a family chooses virtual, mm -hmm. they're virtual through the school year, right? They can't... Well, that was some of our initial conversations, uh, but I think it, it really depends on the number of families who are interested in a virtual option. And I think it also depended upon the what happens. Uh, you know, today, the, you know, the breaking news today was that Dr. Fauci said he's cautiously optimistic that a vaccine will be developed in early, um, early 2021. So if you see, if something like that were to happen, um, you know, we would, we would need to change gears if our reality changes. So I don't want to sit here and tell you that it, it would not be for the year, and perhaps you need to plan for it to be for the year, and you think about it that way. But we also want to understand that we could have any number of families who are infected by this, and we're trying to be as flexible as we can. So I have a question. Will the teachers be working from school or home on virtual learning days? They'll be working from school on virtual learning days. Okay. Are we going to be taking temperatures of the kids coming into school? That's part of the, the strategies we have not yet identified. Uh, we, we're going to, that, that's, that's where we're talking about transition periods and the safety procedures associated with those transition periods. Okay. And so have you gotten as far as the buses and at what percent capacity they'll be operating? So DHEC has provided us feedback on that. Uh, they talk, that's why one of the things is you notice that the middle school and high school, their, their days are delayed is because the elementary schedule, they can only run at 50% capacity. And so we're trying to make accommodations for the amount of time it will take to run morning buses because you may have multiple elementary school routes because you're only running your buses at 50%. And then you've got to make sure you have time for the 
uh, high school and the middle school students to also do what they need to do on the buses. So one of the, one of the uh, really great things is about, um, you know, research around the adolescent brain indicates that they need to start school later. And so high schools have really always been slow to adjust to that. We've always done okay with it, you know, sometime around mid 8 p.m. or something, or 8 a.m., but they used to start high schools at 7.30. And so having a 9 a.m. schedule actually works better for the teenage brain. And so we think we're trying to, we think actually that model will improve quite a bit uh, despite the, the reason why we got there. But yeah, we're trying to make accommodations for buses, trying to make accommodations for how long it's gonna take kids to get to school. And, uh, and so we're still finalizing those plans, but those were some of the acknowledgements. We acknowledge that it's gonna take us longer to get elementary school students to school. So therefore, we're, uh, we're delaying middle school and high school days. Okay, thank you. Consideration for dual enrollment, what does that look like? Well, our, our plan for dual enrollment is business as usual. Okay. Uh, we're gonna, be, we're gonna uh, certainly work with Palmetto uh, College, uh, or I'm sorry, USC Sumter under the umbrella of the Palmetto College and uh, work with them about how we can do dual enrollment. Dr. Smith, do you have anything to add about dual enrollment? So right now what we're working on is how do we schedule that in the context of the models that we presented tonight, but um, all the information that we have right now indicates that students will still have access to every class they've always had access to. And as somebody who's looking to have a child go to college, I'm very excited about that fact. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Shane. Again, I do want to reiterate, um, as of now, I believe we have our information will be going out. Uh, there will, if you go to the lexington1.net website, we have a banner across the board there, but we'll be sending out that, um, there's what you saw tonight will be there. Uh, and then as soon as possible, the presentation by Ms. Uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Phillips will also be up and available. So there's gonna be a ton of information there as well as a, uh, a link for you to ask questions. So um, lots, of, lots of miles to go before we sleep, but um, we're very excited about that. And as part of um, our work today, and, and, and Mr. Moody, I'd like to apologize that you're having to follow that. Oh, I'm, no, I've completely, I've, I'm completely off, uh, I'm completely off. Thank you, Mr. Caldwell. Uh, we do have some things to add about the reentry plan as it relates to student services. And I totally just blew off Mr. Caldwell and I'd like to apologize. I'm gonna leave when I start. <laughs> so a well, part of the reentry plan, of course, includes uh, athletics. And I will tell you, as you look at that first slide, you'll see the word reentry is one word. Mary Beth Hill schooled me today that reentry is no longer hyphenated. I guess we've used it so often in our vernacular now that it's, that it's become one word. But I do want to talk very briefly about our athletic reentry plan that actually has already begun. Um, there we go. And I want to start with the foundational statement. I borrowed some of this language from the high school league, and I think Lexington One. Uh, adheres to that also, and it, that is that the league and the school district believes that it is essential to the physical and mental well-being of students to return to physical activity and athletic competition. To kind of frame that to give you an idea of, of how involved our students are, um, we have approximately, or, or at the end of the 1920 school year, we had about 7,800 students in grades 9 through 12. Of those 7,800, about 3,500 of those students participated in, a, in an athletic uh, uh, activity. That's like 45% of the high school students participated in some athletic uh, opportunity. So when we shut it down in the spring, of course, we didn't shut down all 3,500 by shutting down the, the spring activities, but almost half of our students are currently engaged. So this, this, is a, this has a huge impact on our students that we had to end the year without athletics and the prospect of, being, of not being able to have athletics at the beginning of the year. I will tell you that question is still um, under consideration. We're not really sure what athletic competition is gonna look like, if it's gonna look like anything um, in, the, in the fall. But we have begun uh, the reentry plan and I wanted to share that with you briefly tonight. Uh, again, as uh, Natalie, uh, Dr. Smith mentioned uh, several times, the word safety, well, safety first, of course, is, is the overarching goal of this reentry plan. 
uh, to keep our student athletes, our coaches, our trainers, and any other staff members involved, safety comes before anything else. The, uh, back in late April, early May, uh, David Bennett began working with our high school athletic directors and trainers. And, and let me say this, anybody who knows me knows that I've made a career out of being surrounded or being able to surround myself with people who are much smarter than me. That has never been more evident than through this process because I, we've had the, the work of, of Coach Bennett, the high school athletic directors, high school administrators, the trainers, Amy Wood, who is absolutely a phenomenal resource, uh, Matt McCormick and Clark Cooper in our office have done the heavy lifting on this plan. So I want you to know that first and foremost, without those, those folks' uh, uh, foresight and intelligence and expertise, we probably would not have this plan in place. Uh, but at any rate, uh, in anticipation that the high school league would have some plan, we began planning ahead of that. And uh, in late May, the high school league did uh, submit and disseminate to the districts a three-phase uh, plan to return to, to athletics in the fall. Um, that really didn't tell us what to do. It kind of guided our thinking because we already were, you know, we already had a, a plan in place, and so we were... We were glad to see that what we had developed was kind of in line with what the high school league said. So from that point, we uh, continued to get feedback from the athletic directors, the trainers, the school and district administrators, and phase one of a three-phase entry plan actually began last Monday, June 15th. Now, within that plan uh, of three phases, we have phases within phase one. And well, week one, which was last week, we invited the fall sport athletes back on campus. That's uh, football, uh, volleyball, cross country, you know, those, those type. And I want to tell you that, and of course, in week two, that'll be the winter sport athletes. Week two started yesterday. So that's uh, mainly basketball and uh, wrestling. And then week three, uh, which will start next week, will be the spring sports, baseball, softball, uh, golf, those type things. That's not to imply that phase one will be over in three weeks, but, the, but we wanted to be slow and deliberate in reacclimating the kids back on the campus. Uh, the coaches are emphasizing strength and conditioning workouts over skill development. One thing that we have to realize and accept is that students probably deconditioned over the break. And so we have to, uh, you know, the weather last week was, was pretty kind to us and kind to the athletes. Uh, this week, not so much. Uh, so we have to be sure that we that we go slow and steady, and as we reacclimate those students into the, the the strength and conditioning workouts. And I also want to stress that participation of the athletes and participation of the coaches is completely voluntary. If they, for some reason, for any reason at all, feel like it's not in their best interest to participate at this time, they're not going to be made to do that. And there's no uh, no penalty, no negative consequence for that. Uh, we have had a, a few athletes that have decided it is not in their best interest. Uh, to my knowledge, Coach Bennett, I don't think we've had any uh, adults at this point that have uh, chosen not to participate. But if for some reason they chose to, that is, that is certainly their choice. So again, this is completely voluntary. Uh, some of the health and safety measures that we are taking, uh, as the students arrive on campus each day, uh, there will be temperature checks and health screenings that, that are performed daily. So the way that works, the trainers uh, screen themselves and the coaches, and then the coaches screen uh, the players each day. And the screening involves a temperature check, and it also involves a series of questions. And if they have a temperature of over a, of 100 or more, or they answer yes to some of the questions, then we, we have a process in place. Uh, if they have a temperature of 100 or more, we'll sit them down for 10 minutes check it again. If it's lower than 100, they're able to participate. If not, then they have to, to call home or, or go home for that day. Um, they are, uh, the students are masked when they're not involved in an activity, which basically means they're masked when they arrive to campus and they, they're masked when they leave campus. But when they're there during doing, doing the physical activity, they're certainly not going to be masked. Coaches, however, should be masked at all times. We are maintaining six feet of distance between the participants and 12 feet of distance when working out. So that becomes very challenging. And, and as our numbers grow this week and next week, uh, that becomes even more challenging because we have a limited amount of space with which to, to work with all of these, these athletes. 
Um, the weight equipment can be used. Uh, and when it says clean between each group, I want to stress that the students can go into the weight room. Again, they are 12 feet apart, and but they're not sharing equipment. So if they're working with kettlebells or they're working with dumbbells, they will work with those uh, by themselves. And when that group of 10 leaves and the next group comes in, but in between that transition, all of that will be sanitized. Uh, so they can't share any of the, any of the weight equipment. Uh, there's no more than 10 people allowed in any activity in any group, and that's 10 people including the coaches. So athletes and coaches, no more than 10 in a group. The groups stay together kind of like the family model. Those groups stay together during the entire practice, and they're only allowed in one area at a time. And this probably was the most challenging because we can only have 10 people on a football field. Now, in my mind, when I first heard that, well, we'll take a fence, Coach Bennett, and we'll put it down the 50-yard line, and we'll, we can turn one football field into two. And the high school league was very clear, no, you won't. So 10 people on any facility at one time. So in one gym, in one weight room, uh, on one football field. So again, that's, that's a challenge, and it's getting more challenging as we uh, you know, have more, more students come onto campus. The first 10 weeks, uh, the first 10 days, uh, of the practices, and we are approaching day 10. Uh, there's no uh, balls, no other equipment being used. Uh, after after the on day 11, um, a volleyball player can use a volleyball, but only she can use the volleyball herself and maybe do sets against the wall. Or a coach can throw batting practice to a uh, to a batter with no catcher. And once that's over, those balls are sanitized, and then the next batter comes in, and they're not they're not. Uh, sharing bats or not sharing helmets or not sharing gloves. So it's, it's a very articulated plan of keeping the safety first. Uh, locker rooms and offices are not being used during this phase one. So the students and the coaches are expected to come to campus ready to uh, participate. There's limited restroom access. Basically, it's every other stall that we're using to try to keep that social distancing. Uh, we're not allowing any personal contact, no huddles, no handshaking, no high-fiving, none of, none of that's allowed. Uh, participants bring their own water bottles. They can't share that. If they don't have water bottles, we have water available for them. Uh, so again, there's no, we're, we're trying to cut out the co-mingling as much as possible. Um, just to give you an idea, the first week, which ended last Friday, we had approximately 964 athletes that participated. Uh, and that's in the uh, fall sports. We are adding to that this week. I don't know what those numbers are, but it's certainly going to be well over a thousand. Uh, again, week two, which is the week we're in, uh, started uh, uh, with the winter sports and the middle schools. Um, the middle schools were delayed. We wanted to be sure that we had, first of all, our processes down at the high school level to be sure that we were keeping the kids and the adults as safe as possible. And we wanted to be sure we had the, the proper equipment with the no contact thermometers and that sort of thing. So they will be starting next week or maybe the first week of, of July. And that is, uh, I tried to be as brief as possible, but I will certainly answer any questions that you may have. Mr. Conway. Yes, sir. Any uh, thought being given to the arts, marching band, chorus, uh, orchestra? There is, and I think a group is working on that. That's kind of uh, away from student services, but I did share with them what our reentry plan was, and I think they're using that as a, as a template to, to start that. Yes, sir, and I will be meeting with that planning team, uh, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, we have the fine arts group coming in tomorrow. As you know, the, having, a, having a, um, a band kid in the family, um, this has been quite the uh, conversational piece at the house. And we're trying to figure out how best to do that. Uh, one of the great challenges of, of uh, marching band and really chorus as well is that when you are playing that musical instrument, you are using your breath, you're using, um, I don't want to gross out the room, but you're using a lot of spit bodily fluids to uh, play that musical instrument. <laughs> and there's a lot of force behind that. And so there's a, a lot of concern about what that might look like. But um, we're going to do all we can to, to get band and, and course up and running and, and do so in the best possible situation. But there's also some um, 
uh, coming out shortly. There will be some, uh, I, I saw on the Accelerate Ed uh, plan today, they've got other, uh, people are rolling out other plans about that, but our plan, we're gonna meet tomorrow with that and kind of find out where we are. But, um, but we need those kids playing. I mean, there's no, there's no substitute for practice. And um, you know, you'll see a student who goes, well, I mean, you saw this all the time. In, in August, they, 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 their noise, it sounds like they're killing you know, an animal, and then by December, they're playing music. Well, they, they've done that because they've got a significant uh, practice time between August and, and December, and so we want to maintain that as much as we can. So. We're, we're involved in some, some folks in the band world and the chorus and orchestra. To help yes, sir. But they, they've been part of the planning process, all our band directors <coughs> and, and all those folks. That's a great quote. I won't take up a lot of time, but during World War II, somebody asked Winston Churchill, well, why don't we stop funding the arts, you know, toward the war effort? And his, uh, his answer was, well, what are we fighting for? So let's not forget about the arts. I think Absolutely. they're as important as anything else we do. Agreed. Any other questions I can answer for you? Very good. Thank you. Well, Mr. Caldwell, I'd like to, again, apologize for overlooking you, and I appreciate so much, Coach, and, and your work on making this happen. Thank you very much for all of your efforts. All right, next on, uh, next on our list is we have uh, Mr. Will Moody. Uh, again, Mr. Moody, I apologize for, um, for you uh, having to follow such a, you know, a, a distinguished and panel of, of educators ahead of you, but I know you will represent yourself and, and Gilbert Elementary School well. But uh, if you'll recall, last board meeting, we had Centerville Elementary School present. Uh, the blue and orange of Centerville Elementary School. And uh, today, Mr. Moody would like to talk about uh, changes at Gilbert Elementary School and how that's gonna look. Mr. Moody. Thank you, Dr. Little. And the, the reentry re -entry plan is a tough act to follow, so I'll do my best here. And I was thinking on the way over here, I have the unique distinction of being the last principal of Gilbert Primary School and the first principal of the new Gilbert Elementary School. So that's exciting. And I'm gonna tell you about some of the changes on the horizon for our school. This is the architect's rendering of what the front of our school will look like when the renovations are complete. And uh, we're excited the new signage and some architectural elements there will make it more obvious where the front of our school is and help us welcome visitors when they come in. And our um, improvements are well underway. They jumped on the school and the campus the minute teachers were gone for the summer. Uh, the most visible and obvious changes um, will be a reconfigured car line in front and a bus lane in the back, which helps give us a more efficient flow of traffic on the campus while keeping everybody safe. But we've got lots of improvements and some of these are already complete and uh, we're excited. I do wanna point out that we worked with members of our special education team to select new playground equipment that is inclusive and accessible to students with disabilities. So we're very excited to make our main playground accessible to all children. A few fast facts here. We will continue to serve three-year-olds through fifth grade, and we will continue to be a Title I school. We'll have about 816 students, which is a little smaller than what we were as Gilbert Primary, and we'll have about 117 staff members. That includes certified and support staff. Our school community, our PTO, our SIC, they're all very excited about our new logo that you can see here. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about some of the elements in the logo. You can see we're committed to the red and black color scheme that's um, typical of Gilbert. We've added the block G in the middle, which we feel like strengthens our identity as a Gilbert community school, shows alignment with Gilbert Middle School and Gilbert High School. And the feather in the background is meant to show a connection to the Gilbert High School Indians and the GMS Warriors. So very excited about that new brand for our school. You can see our mission there is to empower students by developing the whole child through academics and leadership. And our vision is growing, learning, leading together. And we believe that the word together captures what Gilbert is all about. Two major initiatives that we're excited about for 2020, 2021, and I'm glad Mr. Oswald mentioned the arts because arts integration or arts integrated instruction is something that I'm very passionate about. We actually started this initiative this current school year and we'll grow that this year. And also AVID, um, I've worked at an AVID school previously and I've seen that work with teachers and students. 
I'll be happy to give you more information about that if you'd like, but what's most important about both of these initiatives, they're both grounded in research-based best practices, but more importantly than that, they open up multiple pathways to success for every child, and we feel that both of these directly support the Lexington One mission and vision. And that's gonna be some exciting things for you to come out and see, we hope you will. Like all Lexington One schools, we'll continue to provide world-class learning experiences, and I've listed a few of those here. You can see our arts integration initiative referenced again there, along with AVID across grade levels. We're excited to see our Spanish immersion program grow from kindergarten all the way through the fifth grade, and we'll continue with the strong social-emotional instruction that we have currently at Gilbert Primary. Well, currently we're only K through two, so now we're adding grades three, four, and five. Yes, sir. And then our major areas of focus for next school year, student engagement, that's where AVID and arts integration along with the workshop model and reading, writing, and math fall under. We'll focus on culture and community. We have a great community at Gilbert Primary and in the Gilbert community itself. But as we rebuild a school family with new staff members from Gilbert Elementary School and students that are coming back to us from Gilbert Elementary, that will be just a big focus. We want to continue to have that warm, welcoming, inclusive family environment that we have, and then the continuous improvement of our learning environment. And that's me. That's quick. We'd love for you to come visit next year and see all the changes. Any questions for me? Thank you, very much. Right. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. And Madam Chair, um, with uh, Mr. Salter's not here tonight, I think it'd be best if we uh, just, uh, we'll, we'll do an operations update at our July meeting and we'll kind of capture all of that, uh, especially with the lateness of the hour and him not being here, if that's okay. Um, it's okay with him, I've already checked. And so um, that concludes my report. Great, thank you, Dr. Little, and thank you, Mr. Salters, for joining us virtually. Um, board <laughs> 16.0 is um, their items for board information. 16.1 uh, includes your monthly general fund financial report for May of 2020, your monthly general fund budget transfers for May of 2020, your monthly capital projects report for May of 2020, your monthly unauthorized procurements report for May of 2020, and your 2019-2020 fiscal year grants report. And I just want to thank everybody for sticking with us so long. This was we we knew it was a big meeting. We it's just a it's just a big year. So we appreciate y'all sticking with us and. Uh, you know, we, I know some people, it's very nerve wracking for them to come in person to contact us. I want to remind everyone again, we have our email addresses, our telephone numbers, um, our mailing addresses, if you want to mail us a letter, um, all on the website. So pl please feel free to contact the board or Dr. Little, any of the senior leadership team. Uh, we welcome your uh, feedback. And um, anyway, 17.0 is adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Green. All in favor, please stand up. And thank you, everyone.